you. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming in. Thank you. First things first, if you could switch this, your version of this guy to the quiet airplane or lecture hall mode. Thank you. Uh, my name is Brett Steele. It's a pleasure to, uh, to briefly welcome, uh, welcome you all to today's fantastic symposium. Uh, Costas has put together just a terrific lineup. Thank you all, all your presenters for coming in for this. It's going to be a fantastic day on the topic of, uh, well, working title Future Matter um, in, in the state of material research, design, imagination engineering in architecture uh, and other cultures today. Um, many, many years ago when I was a student here, we, we had a trip to Foster's office, Foster and Partner, mid-1980s, mid and we, we walked into the office and, and the great thing about the office at that time is you had to run the gauntlet past all of the working drawings which were kept under lock and key. In, in that office for many reasons. And, um, and the, the fellow who was giving us the tour um, very kindly unlocked one drawer and took out a set of drawings and put it on the table. And we were looking at it, and it was a large scale detail of what turned out to be one of the very interesting vulcanized rubber gasket systems that the firm designed for one of their iconic 1970s buildings. And we were looking at these drawings, and I looked down in the, in the title block in the corner, and the scale of drawing was five to one. It was a detail larger than one-to-one. -one. <laughs> Couple of things. First of all, I was the only architect in the world at that time that would have drawn bigger than real, the real world. Um, and in fact, what they were working out was a, was a rubber gasketing system that was then put into production, and I was told at one time, patent protected afterwards. And what they were developing was a kind of rubber that could continuously serve as both a vertical and a horizontal uh, detail for a fantastic cladding system around the building. And, and I was thinking about that this morning in walking into the hall because it's very rare that architects imagine scale as something other than the relationship of a drawing to a building. Today's, today's symposium and, and the topic of new materiality in architecture will, will give us all a chance to look at the state of play in which architects of all kinds today are thinking about not just new materials in unexpected and interesting ways, but the idea that we today, going forward, are designing sometimes at the scale of molecules and not only buildings. And today's lineup of speakers are going to give you an amazing kind of overview of how that kind of thinking is playing out. Um, um, new materiality today isn't just a topic for designers or architects or scientists. It's obviously a topic that's engaging very different kinds of minds in addition to those. It's the kind of topic that engages artists, um, what are still called, I think, futurists, although, although future is an in, uh, increasingly challenging topic on its own, and, and what I think once used to be called imagineers. The question of how to speculate on the topic of materials today isn't just a science problem or an engineering project. It's a question of rethinking some of the kind of basic assumptions uh, of architecture and design more broadly. And I mention that only because we all know that it was exactly a century ago when that thing we think of as modern architecture came to life and emerged alongside the unfolding of all kinds of new materials that literally became the basis for not just new kinds of architecture, which is what some architects argued glass and steel and aluminum needed to do, create a new kind of architecture, but Interestingly, and, and for a site like this, it became the basis for a new kind of architectural education. What went on to become the idea of an experimental architectural academy whose primary job was to mess around with new materials and out of that form ideas that would go on and create architectural projects that we couldn't teach in a traditional academic way. And I think that's really the foregrounding for the kind of reality that today's presenters are engaging today. The fact that that sort of modernist threshold has now exploded um, in more ways than we can probably count around not just new kinds of physical materials, but entirely new ways to simulate, imagine, and even render what those materials might yet deliver in the world. Incredibly, incredibly interesting period, I think, not just for architects and designers, but obviously for what we used to think of as offices and schools, which have to engage that kind of reality. Um, today, more than a dozen, uh, dozen distinguished experts uh, are going to present some of their recent work um, and writings on the topic uh, and give us some of the overview um, that, I, that I think many people in this building particularly are interested in, in having about that kind of world. Um, 
let me just say thank you to all of you who, who came in today for this, and especially to Costas, who's worked very hard and is a design problem, has fully designed today's, um, today's event. Costas, thank you for that, and we look forward to the day. Thank you all. Very much spread for um, enabling this event. Um, it, this has been kind of um, in planning for a very long time, so it's very good to see everybody kind of come together. And uh, actually, it's going to be a very interesting day. Um, I thought to kind of give you an overview and try to frame the actual subject of the of the of the whole symposium in order to get an idea of what do we actually mean when we refer to multimateriality. So this is a quote from uh, Marcelo Spina, actually that. Um, they, they did this, something similar to, to this symposium over in SIARC uh, around three or four years ago called Materials Beyond Materials. So he wrote in the pub uh, ensuing publication after the, the symposium that material as a word and as a subject matter has been the center of discussion within academic conferences and books for almost a decade. And what has been the case with these conferences, however, is that they have been discussing the properties of these materials and uh, the particularities of the actual material. But what is actually happening at the moment is that we're entering into this phase where architecture is uh, itself is changing. And what he was asking in the publication is what if material itself was put into question? Um, what if the very assumption of material as a pure, a stable, and discrete property upon which we formulate and construct often as stable things was uh, you know, liable to change as well? And also, even more importantly, what he actually did at the end was he, he, he asked this question is about what if material itself became a form of assembly. So the way uh, to give you an idea that this kind of presentation has been structured is to show what is happening on the architectural scale in terms of uh, 3D printing and uh, the latest uh, uh, changes. And also what is happening on disciplines that are kind of adjacent to architecture, such as aerospace engineering and engineering in general. This is a, an instance that, that I came across recently, which is the nacelle hinge on, of an Airbus. What they used to do up until now is that they used to, bo to weld the, the hinge together. And this was obviously, apart from being environmentally not very friendly, it kind of uh, had a very big weight impact on the overall weight of the aircraft. So what I've been doing recently is to optimize the, the actual connection and to 3D print it as one singular piece, which is something that reduced the weight of the aircraft by almost 10 kilos. And this also allowed um, to the, the, the emissions to be reduced by a very large percentage. And in parallel to this, there is other kind of developments in, uh, I was looking at the European Sta Space um, Agency that was kind of, um, uh, details of, of which were part of the symposium brief as well, that they are planning on sending the world's first 3D printed satellite in space by 2020. So this is basically going to reduce the overall cost of the, of the, of the satellite by 50%, and this is a very crude version of what will be a satellite in the near future. Uh, and at the same time, um, in construction, in architecture, uh, Foster and in collaboration with Skanska, the, the the contractor and engineering company that are looking into how they can actually 3D print concrete in actual full scale uh, sizes, uh, one to one. Uh, a bit, going a bit back in around 2011, uh, there was this recent, uh, this uh, TED talk that was actually laying out all of the things that we're, we're going to see 3D printed soon. And it was pretty incredible that this was out in 2011, mid 2011, and already by the beginning of 2012, some of these things were uh, happening already, like 3D printed food and uh, uh, guns and, and meat and leather and so on and so forth. And going a bit forward, this was a, a very recent issue of uh, Wired magazine, where they were actually, the whole magazine was uh, dedicated to the changes that we're going to see in the world in 2015. And a very kind of small sub article of that was uh, suggesting that we're going to see 3D printed buildings. Um, if you put that in perspective, uh, and this is quoting again from the uh, SIAR conference, the, the US construction industry is kind of uh, worth about $1.6 trillion in size, of which um, a very large, uh, about 30%, as it says here, is uh, the construction industry. 
and from that there is a very kind of a large amount of, 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 of money and, and resources that are being lost because inefficiencies in construction. And this is all happening because of uh, inefficiencies in material waste, workflow processes, information flow, and so on and so forth. So what we are already seeing happening is, this is an example in China, uh, I think it's around three, four months ago, that they actually managed to 3D print 10 houses over a time span of 24 hours. And this is the actual result, and although you would expect that they would be all on site kind of uh, fabrication, what happens is they, they, I mean, you can actually see the, the, the joints here. They, they, they print, 3D print it out uh, off-site in segments, and then assemble it back on site. And what this does is, uh, apart from kind of saving material and, and, and labor, it also saves quite a lot of time as well. Um, when that happened, the planning regulations in China weren't allowing for to go beyond two stories. So the, the, the regulation weren't really catching up with the te technological advancements. But already this kind of came out like maybe a month ago, which is the world's tallest 3D printed building, basically that's around six stories high. Um, this is the interior of it, and what I was reading is that they managed to reduce material by 80%, labor cost by 70%, and time by 60% doing that. And also, like uh, as we've seen around, like Foster and Partners looking into 3D uh, moon bases, and also <coughs> even stretching this out, like uh, whole cities constructed as 3D printed landscapes that evolve over time and change. Um, so this is one part in, uh, that relates directly to architecture and construction. At the same time, uh, in aerospace engineering, um, what is happening is they must be around 20 to 30 years in front of architecture, in a, in a sense. When they kind of started using composite materials in 1975 or something like that, uh, it was back in 1975, and in architecture, I mean, this has been the case for around 10 years or something like that. So what they do is they, because of the very kind of extreme environments that they have to place their components that they build, they need to constantly be pouring millions and millions of dollars in research about new materials that can withstand these uh, temperatures. So if you see like a satellite, it has about five to six different uh, composite materials, one being just here on the, on the nose of the aircraft, uh, which is a carbon carbon fiber composite, and then a highly insulated material over here to withstand the temperatures. And even more uh, kind of interestingly, inside the actual um, rocket, what happens is that they have these carbon fiber panels that are attached to the structure of the aircraft with these bolts, which, I mean, might seem insignificant as a little detail of this whole kind of uh, aircraft, but uh, something that can go wrong in, in that kind of case can have a very, very large impact to, to, to the whole mission that has been planned for many years. So the problem that has been happening there is that the coefficient of the carbon fiber panel uh, is different to the actual bolts that secure it into the structure, the thermal co coefficient. So that means that the, the, the panels up until now used to decouple from the structure. So what they, the engineers did very ingeniously was to actually do a graded material, a multi-material, a crude version of which is over here were, that would have steel internally, and then it would have a, an alloy on the outside. And then on the center, it would just be a gradient material, as you see over here. So what this kind of very cleverly did was to um, have the perimeter have the same coefficient as the carbon fiber panel, and then the interior the same coefficient as the bolts. So that would mean that the panels would no longer decouple. Uh, in fact, these kind of materials in this kind of field were invented as back as the 1980s. This is uh, a sample of material called functionally graded, which is basically a uh, multi-material. It's consisting on the right-hand side of steel and then on the left from ceramic. And they actually came up with this in order to withstand very high temperatures in space flight. What, what kind of this is departing from is um, the idea of composite as a, as, a, as a material that has been kind of discussed about for a very long time now. And the very kind of a uh, big advantage of these materials is that um, moving away from composites and the idea that you have to kind of laminate and glue things together to create uh, uh, skins and structures, um, 
there is always this kind of problem with the, with the composites, the fact that you, you need to use very, very big molds in order to, to construct them and assemble them. So by definition, as a material, it has a kind of a lot of restrictions that have to do with its fabrication capabilities and, and how it can be manufactured. Whereas what happens in, in with multi-materials is there's no such restriction. No? You can 3D print in, uh, in on site and continuously and with no other kind of uh, uh, problems in mind. Just to give you an idea what is happening uh, at the moment, uh, this is a research initiative by the German government that actually we're looking into give funding into different initiatives that are looking into the future of the built environment. And from the context of this in in initiative, about 95% of this wa was relating to environmental kind of uh, initiatives. But one of these ones here was looking into how graded <coughs> materials and multi-materials can be applied in architecture. This was something that Michael Herman, that is going to be speaking in a bit, was part of. And even more kind of importantly, I think this was a very interesting uh, ending to the article where basically they were, the, the scientists were envisaging that sooner or later this is going to happen. We're going to have multi-materials fusing together and like creating some uh, continuous construction that is going to eliminate uh, a lot of uh, problems in, um, in uh, uh, buildability and so on and so forth. So what kind of the whole idea with the symposium is as well is the fact that up to now we have been designing uh, pretty much like uh, um, Piranesi did the, when he was depicting the Pantheon, doing conventional plans, thinking about boundaries and uh, voids and solids. The stage that we're at now at the moment is something like this, uh, where we are in, in this immediate intermediate stage between a very advanced kind of way of constructing things in 3D printed form and into actually retrofitting conventional architectural elements like windows and, 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 and uh, doors and, and so forth. But what actually the symposium is kind of trying to, to, to frame is something like this, where construction sooner or later is going to be getting to this stage where everything is going to be continuous, uh, multi-materially fabricated, and there's no need to um, think of architecture as components, as tectonics, but as, as something that is really continuous. So these are the, some of the questions that are actually put there to, f to frame a bit the discussion that is going to come later on. And uh, yeah, I mean, with that, um, again, I'd like to welcome you here. And we're going to have three speakers to, to start with. Uh, Michael Herman from the Institute of Lightweight Structures is going to present his PhD research. Uh, Mustafa and Visu from Zaha did uh, in the code group, they've been kind of doing research into multi-materials. And first, there's going to be Stefan Bassing, who's going to present his research from the Bartlett. Uh, thank you. My name is Stefan Bassing. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. It's an honor to be here. I'm going to present today um, my final thesis at the Bartlett, the other school down the road, basically, um, Deep Texture, which I did um, at RC8 in 2013, last year. And um, I want to start off with this picture, which is um, an image of a fashion piece by Daniel Wiedrich of the Crystallization um, series together with Iris von Herpen, who he did in 2010. And this image is kind of important to me since Daniel was one of the reasons which I came to London. But also I think in his, and to study with him, and but also for him to kind of question what materiality um, means to himself. Um, back then, I think it very much showed what kind of possibility 3D printing offers you, like free freedom in form, freedom, complete freedom in design. On the other hand, having it as a kind of garment on your body, it also revealed that the material is not the appropriate material. It's completely stiff, it's not moving. And also that the fabrication technology is high in cost, taking, uh, consuming a lot of time and not very efficient. And from there on, I think also his personal interest um, shifted in his, in his work, even though this kind of um, collaboration kicked off um, his career. So 
I'm also since then teaching with him um, at RC, now RC6 at the Bartlett, which I used to be studying in. And basically coming from this previous image, Daniel's personal um, interest shifted more towards craft and materiality, so moving away from something that is time consuming and basically only offers you this one materiality of um, polymers into something that is um, more tactile, that is more um, applied, and is more related to the idea of handicrafts, which basically means an artisan that is developing his own technique working with materials. So I just want to introduce two student projects in order to frame this agenda and idea a little bit. Um, this is a project by Shu, um, Young, and um, Cherry. And this project particularly linked their work back to a certain kind of craft that they developed. So basically, they um, embedded rubber tubes into sand and then pulled them out and cast it into the voids and through like many iterations and developing their own craft further throughout the year, they managed to um, develop um, pieces of high complexity, geometric complexity and beauty. And eventually through like digital simulation, we created languages of um, structural bundles that later on could um, form complex tectonics. And we really worked through all kinds of scales where we developed furniture pieces as well as building proposals. And I think the most interesting part that those furniture pieces actually work and you can sit on them. Um, another project which is not so much linked to the craft but more to a kind of material system was um, the project Augmented Skin by Kasushi, Young, and Theodora. And what they basically did, they started to um, set up a system between three kind of material sets, which was for one kind of skeleton, like a more or less um, rotational joint-based um, sort of reba system, and then a kind of skin that was wrapping around and holding the whole structure together, and then later on a cast material that would be cast into the skin and solidified the structures. And what was the advantage here, again, in opposition to the aforementioned technology of 3D printing, is that it's super low cost and fast to erect. And on the right hand side, you can see an actual prototype they built. And through stitching, they could eventually control the deposition of um, the casting material. So basically, um, staying close to the material system, they developed um, a strategy of interlocking strands, which later on they translated into a couple of architectural proposals. And again, they worked through all kinds of scales, going from furniture systems um, into building kind of systems and interior spaces. Um, so basically, coming from this kind of agenda where you really look into materials, where you look into crafting techniques, the year I was studying before, this was not as clear, but I think it evolved a little bit more out of that also. On the right-hand side, you can see um, more or less what I have developed, which is kind of a granulate or a set of bricks or cells cast back then through like a kind of DIY um, injection molding technique into various materials and then which I would later on assemble. And now I'm just gonna t talk to you um, briefly through like my preliminary studies since it's a design symposium, I wanted to also focus on those sketches. And then the definition of the term, um, the importance of fractal tiling to me, architectural granulate, composite materiality, liquid state, texture, technologies, and typology as well as an architectural proposal. <laughs> Um, so the preliminary studies, what we were doing throughout the year was basically always focusing on three-dimensional tiling systems. We were more or less obsessed with this. And what we were trying to do was going from one state into the other, basically it's having a transition in structures. So for example, going from a lattice kind of shell state into a more set solid kind of structural state. And therefore, I personally looked into moments of um, structural transitions. So on the left-hand side, you see an experiment on more or less collision where basically you have different material elements and they kind of collide and try to go from one state into the other. On the right-hand side, the kind of logic of interlocking strands or a kind of linear transition from a more lattice kind of structure into a solid kind of volume-filled structure. Or another study where I was looking more into networks and then into volumes that are objects that are embedded within those networks. Then again, there was an interest of kind of state or change of states, so basically going from a regular into a more kind of melted, sort of reduced state, and then having like regular boundary conditions and what would happen within those conditions, and how could the inner structures basically melt down, change, while certain um, logic still remain evident. 
And then how would you actually separate those dates into different moments and then later on have a more or less like a vocabulary or a set of forms that you could transition in between. And then also what does it mean on a kind of graphical level like um, when you reduce this information to pure pattern and how could this play later on a role in your design. So this was kind of all very um, abstract. <laughs> and also in the sense that I wanted to work is that I always had like a certain interest in pattern and texture and the relation between 2D information and 3D. So I framed more or less my concept in the beginning and had the title ready before I did have a project. <laughs> so um, the way that the title was defined was um, deep texture implies a relation between logics of material behavior geometrical logics of transition and changes in resolution of one system to be revealed as texture on the surface of the final structure, as for example, to be found in nature. References are the textures of marble or tree rings, which represent the riches of visual information, revealing logics of formation and growth. So basically, in opposition to just like a flat pattern, that is 2D something that is texture that has certain haptic and it really goes deep into the material. So in order to sort of set up this deepness or the deepness of information, I would of course have to think about the actual um, source of information and since we were working with um, tiling systems, I really looked more deeper into tiling systems and ended up into looking into these rhombic structures which when you research find out that they also resemble or are to be found in nature as in crystals and also in the smallest forms in for example bacteria or viruses and they're also fractals which was interesting to me because they, this allowed me to go or to change in resolutions and basically having like the smallest elements, for example, defining architectural elements of door handles or furniture pieces and then later on the structure could transition into more kind of global form which could then form tectonics of buildings. And these were the four tiles that I was the most interested in or that were more or less the essence of all my studies. And the great thing about these four tiles is that you can aggregate them in multiple ways. So on the right hand side, you see more or less through like further experimentation, the conclusion or manifestation of a transition going from a shell kind of state to a lattice kind of state into a um, more kind of semi-shell, semi-lattice kind of state, just by aggregating those tiles in a certain way, taking out certain, taking out certain tiles and basically having the ability to create a quite rich vocabulary of, of structures. So once I had set up <coughs> this manifestation of transition of these three elements, I was able to, to play and extract further um, geometrical information and develop basically three main structures, which was one kind of uh, complete monocoque shell kind of system, which then when I would take out more elements, would transition into almost a vein-like finer grain kind of system. And this is basically something that I called the structural comps where I would fill up those shells and make them completely solid so that they would resemble a certain strength. And the third kind of um, structure, which is more a lattice or a scaffold kind of structure, which is, is purely um, structural and holding up the piece. And this all basically consists out of the four tiles that you've seen before, and it's just about really um, setting up the aggregation, being aware where you, or how you deploy um, the geometries. So basically coming to the more interesting part that is, I think, um, more relevant probably for, for the symposium today is what would I actually be doing with these tiles? Um, and how can I use them to not only have um, trans transitions in structure, but also transitions in material behavior and conditions. So I call this the architectural granulate, and it basically allows you to go not only from one structural state to another, but also from like one material state to the other, so you can tr could transition from a more porous kind of surface into a more like surface-like condition, or let's say uh, transparent or flexible into a more rigid or opaque kind of material state. So I basically put down two material conditions that were the most important for me because they were the most relevant for me in the sense of architecture. One was the relationship between softness and rigidity, or let's say rigidity and flexibility, and this was um. One strand that I built that has um, rubber cast cells or bricks in the center and more PU um, resin stiffer parts on the outside and I would actually be able to twist and bend this element 
And then you can start to think about joints, you can start to, to think about furniture, soft response surfaces, etc. And another condition that was important to me was this moment of transparency and translucency or opaqueness, basically um, getting daylight into the building, kind of having certain areas where you have privacy. And therefore, I developed this kind of idea of a transition between opaque conditions and transparent conditions. And then, of course, you start to, to think about this idea of um, composite materiality, which initially I was inspired by 3D printing. So on the right-hand side, you actually see, see a 3D print. And I think one of the main things in my research was just to question scale. <laughs> Basically, what a 3D print is also setting out um, more or less one material cell and printing one material cell at a time. So in my case, I just took this cell and, and scaled it up and also applied a certain kind of geometrical logic to it that I would actually have more um, possibilities in kind of um, design solutions. So the idea would be that actually through a certain kind of aggregation, you could um, then also grow and assemble your own material in the way that you desire. And therefore, in the beginning, my first initial tests were rubber and resin and wax. And then I shifted to PLA. So PLA is basically a thermoplastic. And what's great thing about PLA is that it has a very low melting temperature. And the chemically bonded um, molecule chains are very easy to release. So basically, once you heat up the PLA, it melts down. And it more or less breaks the chains. And once it's cooling down, form a kind of separated parts then can be fused back into one material entity. So it's almost like a process of welding, where through heat you weld together, um, form a separate parts, and then diffuse into one strong material bond. So coming from basically melting away material, you also start to have, or you have to start thinking about how you solve this condition of, of melting, <laughs> and how do you also con solve this condition of redundant material. I kind of took this as an advantage to say, OK, I can also use it as a moment of transition where I go from very rigid and edgy kind of um, formal conditions into something that is soft and vein like and again resembles a completely different structural but also material condition. And these were some material tests related to that thinking where, again, I took kind of or I described a certain volume or entity surrounded by, for example, a structural boundary condition. Or this way, again, had like a boundary condition and then could transition into um, a kind of translucent or almost transparent kind of state. And you could see all on the left-hand side um, something that was formerly consisted out of bricks or now that it's been melted down, forms um, complex double curved surfaces, which I think is a quite um, interesting moment, especially because it's fairly cheap and for free. And on the right-hand side, I think it was one of my favorite moments where you could actually see um, the texture rise on the surface. And you would have this moment where you could read the aggregational logic that describes the geometry deep into the surface. Coming out of this idea of texture, I also had, was refining or defining the idea of kind of material distribution and described it as um, the texture reveals the inherent logics of the tiling system as well as material distribution logics within the system. The patterns vary from more regular and evenly distributed material ratios to patterns that represent vein-like structures. Eventually, though the texture structural logics as well as the material shifts from soft to hard and opaque to translucent and are being indicated as previously described. <laughs> so here in this image, you can basically see this, how I'm going from something that is as a regular kind of mix into this vein-like um, moment of transition into like um, a completely different single material kind of state. Towards the end of the project, I started to develop an architectural scenario um, where I basically started to describe architectural uh, tectonics and also how I would basically transition between purely structural conditions and space conditions, space-like conditions, and therefore divided up mainly the architectural tectonics and spaces into two categories. But I kind of was looking at it from a point of a human body, let's say, where you have these different elements of, a, of bones, skin, vein, and muscle kind of tissue. And they not necessarily 
um, completely transitioned seamlessly, but there are moments where they are connected and where they are attached to each other on, and there are moments of transition. But it's not like an overall continuous transition. These elements are readable in their own as they are and function in their own as they are. But then, of course, you have to deal with these boundary conditions. So these were initially um, initial experiments of more or less the space frame that would surround the building. And then I had would have um, soft body kind of space enclosures that would nest within this kind of skeleton. So this would be more or less the essence, the diagram of a space frame where you would have these completely solid and rigid parts and how they would transition into a skeleton or a scaffold-like lattice-like structure and how, then how this lattice would actually transition into a, a purely monocoque space kind of um, enclosure and you would see how you would have actually these structural veins running on the outside and then the grain granularity mix, granular mix is kind of changing and then real transitioning in this pure um, shell kind of condition. And the design was a proposed visitor center on the coast of, of England and what I was trying to present in, in this image is that I really have this change in resolution where I go from like a global kind of really rough tectonic into something that has a finer granularity and then transitions really in these kind of um, embedded space enclosures. This is a close-up view where you can basically see the, the higher resolution of um, the structure. And towards the end I developed also a smaller prototype which is so to speak a micro pavilion or a kind of sculpture let's say where you would have these two conditions going really from a pure structural element into a surface like kind of condition transitioning from more rigid parts into something that is more flexible or in this case um, opaque, translucent. And then in the center you would really have a new kind of state, more or less a state of melting where the structure melts down and something new evolves, something a little bit more um, organic and out of control and less rigid and controlled as the elements before assembled. So this is the piece as a whole, and on the right-hand side you can see the surface in the front, where this was really melted down to, to a thin kind of membrane skin layer. Unfortunately, it didn't turn out completely um, transparent, but you would have moments of translucency and where this would start to become something that you could imagine later on being, for example, a window or something that lets light through. And here, I think you can see nicely how this from a really kind of lattice sort of state transitions into a double curved surface, uh, surface that later on bends back into the initial structure. Yes, that's it. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you again for the invitation. Thanks, Costas, uh, for uh, setting up this symposium about uh, multi-materiality. And uh, I feel the first time I, I, I'm uh, presenting my PhD thesis uh, now to you. And I, I've been talking a lot on uh, concrete symposiums and uh, computational mechanics symposiums. And I feel uh, this is uh, the, the first time uh, I, I'm on the right symposium um, to <laughs> talking uh, to, to the right people who, who are going to understand what, I, what I'm trying to say and what I'm researching on. Um, because uh, you showed this uh, uh, functionally graded materials uh, which were, we were started researching on at the beginning. I want to talk more about functionally graded concrete, focus on functionally graded concrete. Um, and how uh, I moved there. A little bit about my background at the beginning. Uh, I'm coming from the Institute for Lightweight Structures and Conceptual Design in Stuttgart, and it's an institute where we have both. We have uh, architects, and uh, it's an institute joined from two institutes. The, the former institute of Professor Frei Otto, 
who uh, you all might know, uh, who is famous for this uh, lightweight membrane uh, double curved structures in Germany, um, which uh, did the uh, architectural part uh, at the institute, and the other part was uh, Professor Jörg Schleich, who is a sophisticated structural engineer. And uh, Professor Werner Sobeck uh, uh, joined these institutes together 20 years ago, bringing together architects and engineers uh, under, under the concept of lightweight structures and uh, structural optimization. So I started working with the, uh, the first project, uh, production processes and areas of application for functionally graded building components, where we were really open to all kind of materials. Uh, uh, Costas showed this uh, picture from the uh, timber uh, transition uh, to maybe metal. Uh, but uh, uh, with the research, I figured out that the biggest impact functionally graded materials could have on the uh, building uh, industry would be functionally graded concrete and the uh, optimization uh, of the inner porosity of uh, building components. So the next project I uh, worked mainly on was mass reduction in functionally graded load-bearing elements I would like to talk about. And when you uh, talk about uh, functionally graded materials, it's always uh, about uh, how to manufacture this uh, uh, materials. So uh, we set up a new research project uh, funded by the German government. Uh, and it's running now for six years, uh, optimized structures of functionally graded concrete, where uh, different researchers come together. We have a mechanical engineer who is responsible for the robot we're building up and we have material science uh, guys uh, for the concrete mix design. So it, it really started growing and uh, five years uh, ago, n nobody was uh, thinking about functionally created materials in building science. Uh, and now uh, I'm lucky uh, to be on this symposium. Um, normally I need to explain what functionally graded materials are. Uh, <laughs> and functionally graded materials uh, uh, are per definition materials which change one or, or more properties continu continuously in one or more spatial direction. And an easy way to explain this is always the uh, Latte Macchiato, which has a material transition from 100% coffee to 100% uh, milk, and in between all different states. So, wh what, uh, what can this be used for in building science? Um, the option I, I focused my work about is uh, mass saving and protection of resources, also saving CO2 by designing uh, the inner porosity <coughs> of, a, of a building component like it is done by nature in the, in the human bone where um, porosity is changing from dense areas and high strength areas where you need stiffness and the material density to porous areas where you don't need the weight. And uh, another thing you can achieve with this kind of concrete uh, uh, components is uh, multifunctional, build up multifunctional components, uh, like uh, fair faced concrete walls, changing from uh, dense load uh, bearing uh, layers at the outside to highly porous uh, layers which have uh, thermal isolation properties in the inside. Also, another project which uh, started at our institute is focusing on new joining technologies in uh, fiber reinforced uh, polymers, changing from a polymer matrix to a metal matrix in the joint where you can uh, set uh, profiles, weld together uh, with a metal matrix and you have a much higher efficiency than with the polymer metrics uh, for the fibers. But if you're uh, uh, entering this field, you need to answer three main questions um, uh, about the porosity design in concrete. The first uh, question is how to produce the air voids in the concrete. The second question to answer is how uh, to distribute the air voids well directed. How can you organize that? you have the air void where you want to have it. And the last question is how to calculate the graduate layout. So the first question 
is uh, we uh, uh, went this way, that we started uh, with two extreme concrete mixes. One is a, a normal concrete having uh, normal aggregates, and then uh, uh, we, we had the question which is the lightest possible concrete uh, as a light extreme mix. So we um, continuously changed the normal uh, ag aggregates uh, to lightweight aggregates in the concrete till they are maximum, uh, maximally packed. And then we, um, we uh, put a, a porous material uh, in the remaining cement matrix uh, to even make it more porous and lighter. You can see uh, the results here. Um, we did it in seven steps, starting from the uh, normal concrete on the outside up to uh, the uh, here uh, uh, shown KM uh, core mix, uh, which is the lightweight concrete, just weigh, weighing 10% of the uh, normal concrete. And with changing the porosity, you're changing all <coughs> material properties of the concrete mix design. Uh, you, you're changing with a, uh, is there a laser pointer here? Or? No, okay. <laughs> so at the, at the bottom with, uh, uh, with more porosity, uh, the density is going down, but also the compressive strength and the uh, stiffness of the concrete mix, but uh, you have more porosity and the thermal conductivity is uh, improving. After having developed this uh, concrete mix designs, we uh, answered, the, we, we uh, thought about the question how to manufacture um, uh, components with this concrete mixes and uh, how to continuously uh, change the material properties. Um, we thought about, uh, we, we had a look on the other, on material science, on aerospace science, what kind of uh, manufacturing processes they were using and one uh, close, <laughs> thank you. What one, one close uh, uh, manufacturing process could be layering, layer these different mixes on top of each other. Um, we also uh, made tests with uh, controlled segregation by rotating a column. Um, but we, uh, we uh, soon uh, uh, saw that uh, we needed to go into uh, methods of rapid prototyping and we developed this functionally uh, graded spraying uh, technology, uh, which uh, uses two uh, concrete mix designs. One is the uh, strong and heavy concrete, and one is the lightweight concrete. And you have two concrete pumps, which have a volume control. And by controlling this volume, you can change from 100% mix one to 100% mix two, and all the properties in between. Um, to have a controlled process, uh, you, we we uh, needed to uh, think about automation of this process, and uh, we we set up a concept for this portal robot um, positioning the spraying nozzles um, where we need this. And here you can see a video of uh, the current state of the robot, uh, which is uh, printing out of two mixes, uh, layer-wise the concrete components. Still a little bit messy, <laughs> but uh, we're improving. And now, after having the manufacturing method, we thought about the application. Um, uh, sure, uh, applica application could be slabs by uh, optimizing the inner porosity, saving mass and saving CO2, but also these multifunctional walls are really interesting. Because I'm an engineer, I did a lot of uh, testing uh, for this kind of slabs. So I made up uh, a layered, uh, uh, a layered uh, functionally graded concrete setup in uh, two scale dimensions. One uh, was uh, testing small components with one meter span. And you, here you can see a big component having four meter span. Um, and this testing was to uh, see how the load bearing behavior is and how much uh, mass we can save. I also uh, tried different reinforcing materials. Uh, here you can see the results by the force deflection diagram. And uh, this one is, uh, the, uh, is the steel reinforced uh, 
uh, functionally graded concrete uh, beam, and these uh, here are the uh, textile reinforced with carbon fiber reinforced um, functionally graded concrete beams. And with this carbon fiber reinforcement, it's possible to save up to 60% mass by achieving the, late, uh, the same load bearing capacity than a normal flat slab would uh, achieve. But uh, because uh, carbon fiber has a really high tensile strength, uh, but, uh, by, uh, but you need less area and the stiffness is almost the same than the stiffness of steel. So the deflection, uh, which you can see here in this carbon fiber reinforced uh, slabs are much bigger than the one of, uh, if you use uh, reinforcement steel. Um, to develop a design process, uh, I, I put uh, I uh, made a material nonlinear simulation, FE simulation, uh, of this kind of beams, um, where I could um, where I could compare the simulation results with the test results. And here you can see the test results. Here you can see the results of the simulation. So I was able to set up a simulation which uh, can closely reproduce these results. And on top of this simulation, I had a look on topology optimization routines to numerically design um, a density la layout, which you can hand over to the robot building up this concrete component. Here you can see uh, what's happening if you put in this reference uh, beam into the optimization tool. It's ending up with a uh, density design, which is uh, uh, shown here by this colors changing from the lowest density to one uh, to the highest density. And using this optimization process compared to the sandwich design, which I investigated before, I could additionally uh, add 30% of stiffness uh, to the beam. And compared to the flat slab, I could, I could reduce the mass total in 62%. So now we have the design tools uh, um, to design this uh, kind of um, mass saving compon uh, components. The other thing I want to have a look on it is uh, functionally graded walls, which I was uh, two years ago, I was at the Bau in uh, Munich presenting uh, this kind of uh, functionally graded material. Uh, and I talked to a lot of architects and they were really interested in functionally graded uh, walls multi-material walls, being able to build uh, fair face concrete walls out of one material again would be really interesting for our buildings. Because right now, uh, typically if you build a wall system, you need to uh, build up, you need to uh, uh, stick to the government regulations uh, by thermal isolation. And this is adding up, uh, maybe a normal system could be a 24 centimeters masonry wall, uh, combined with 20 centimeters of uh, thermal isolation and all the other layers. But this, uh, you stick all of it together and you end up with a special waste at the end if you w there's no way to recycle this. Uh, there, there, uh, uh, research, there's research going on about a homogeneous isolating concrete using for walls, but this is a, a bad compromise in between of thermal isolation and strength. So. And this would add up to maybe 80 centimeters because you have uh, uh, this uh, continuous, uh, you, you have this uh, single property. If you use this multi-property <coughs> concrete, you can have a dense layer on the outside and uh, isolation layer in between. And you can fulfill the NF uh, 2014 with 25 centimeters uh, of wall. And it's, uh, it's a monofraction wall, it's just concrete, all, uh, all the same material. And uh, what I also wanted uh, to talk uh, or discuss with you later on is taking uh, this kind of uh, design principles to the ne next uh, uh, level in, in scale. This was a diploma thesis uh, done at our institute and uh, uh, architectural diploma thesis about uh, this uh, 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 foam uh, as, a, as a design principle to, to a, a graded cell tower. And uh, 
there, there, there was a parametric design process at the beginning, adding up all the all the all the spaces up together and uh, uh, putting this uh, this uh, uh, this uh, space frame into optimization, uh, structural optimization, ending up with a functionally graded stiffness uh, with very low strength and stiffness at the at the top, uh, improving strength and stiffness to the bottom. Also, with my um, own uh, engineering consultant office, we started uh, uh, working on this uh, kind of uh, structures. And this is a pavilion for the German gardening fair, which is using um, this kind of cell-based uh, stiffness design, um, showing what is possible right now in ultra-high performance and functionally graded concrete. So with this example, I'm at the end, and I'm really looking forward to the discussion at the end of the session. Hi, good morning. Um, my name is Mustafa Sayed, and this is my colleague Vishu. We both work at uh, Zah Hadid Architects in the Computation and Design Research Group. I'd uh, just like to start by thanking Costas for inviting us over to the conference. And um, it's interesting to see that we are, we're following uh, quite a technical presentation in a inter very interesting way. Um, I guess we'll be covering um, some more design-oriented strategies we use in the office, uh, relative mostly to this multi-materiality concept, and um, taking a higher level just view of how we work across some of these problems. Right? So I won't go necessarily into detail. We'll just be showing you a, a broad spectrum of what we do and how we think we do it. So um, I think we're here at the AA. Most people know the office. <laughs> Um, the research group is an eight-year-old entity within the office. It's a very small team, and um, we essentially get to do small research-oriented projects, as well as applying some of those learned lessons on the broader scale, larger projects in the office. Um, so essentially, the agenda of the research team kind of uh, is malleable and evolves over time. In the last couple of years, or last few years, the research team has been uh, primarily focused on this idea of structurally biased design, um, uh, partly due to the demands of the projects the office is undertaking, partly due to the interests of the team itself. And uh, we've been essentially working on ways to improve our methodologies. So if, if you've seen some of our work, you're probably, uh, it's fair enough that you think a lot of what we do is uh, structural research in a sense. We do a lot of these kind of pavilion projects where we're investigating um, how to translate the structural information into built form uh, in, an, in a certain designed way. Uh, we've worked with uh, various fabrication techniques, which has increasingly become part of the research team's uh, agenda, which is we have to uh, engage fabrication technology more and more and try to make that information bleed over into our projects. So this was a project we did in 2012 with uh, Gregory Epps from Robofold here in North London, or South London, Brixton, um, who has a bunch of industrial robots in his garage. And we were doing um, origami-inspired curve folding to build uh, a six-meter tall uh, pavilion in, in the Venice Biennale for 2012. Um, again, in 2012, a composites-based project just two weeks after Venice where we were investigating um, how we could use the idea of fabric formwork to describe um, doubly curved surfaces and then rendering that with fiberglass to build very cheap and lightweight uh, resin shells, fi fiberglass shells. So this was in SIARC in the summer of 2012. 
And um, I think we've seen this a few times over the day, and I think we'll be seeing it a few more times over the course of the day. This idea of topology optimization was a digital method that um, came in quite strongly into the office uh, around 2013. And this was a small research prototype we did in Mexico, in Mexico City, regarding how to translate that information into a quick and easy to build concrete language. But we also do other kinds of projects that you know, are uh, you know, not necessarily only structurally oriented. This was a 80 square meters of uh, Lycra installation in the Disney Concert Hall in Los Angeles, where the idea is where you design a transforming structure, which was essentially run by these huge trusses. So it's this idea of just engaging technology and computation at many levels. Uh, we also actually work on built projects so for example, this one has been in the media three months ago, uh, which is a corporate headquarters in Dubai, where we were in, you know, I think everyone knows what they're looking at here. It's just uh, tiling studies um, about rationalizing a tiled surface. So the, you know, the bread and butter of a research team in an office. Um, we also do our own small projects. So this is the mathematics gallery in the Science Museum in London due to open in two years. So this was like a small internal project to the research team. So I guess why Costas invited us here today is to talk primarily about this project, which was a small um, research prototype, which started with a conversation with Naomi Kempfer from Stratsys, who are the company that own Object. And they approached us to do a small research project with them regarding their new um, Connex printers. And I guess what they came to us with this mandate that you know we can print at the one by one meter box, uh, multi materials. This is you know their catalog. It, it ranges in color. It ranges in flexibility. It ranges in stiffness, and so you you can mix quite a few uh, amount of properties in the single print. And it kind of made sense to us to explore this idea of a three D printed chair for a couple of reasons. One is um, this was a side project. We had to do it pretty rapid fire. Two, the box was an interesting size, one to one, so we could actually, one meter by one meter, so we could print a one to a scale prototype. Rather than printing a one to two or one to five prototype, we would build the full scale performative piece. And in our opinion, the chair has been an interesting research uh, typology for a while now, right? So this is the Eames chair, and we, you've seen, we've seen in the past that a lot of interesting people have taken the chair on as a research problem, right? Both in an aesthetic way, but in a fabrication uh, direction, as well as, you know, uh, trying to express their ideas into this performative prototype. So we found it quite interesting to take that on uh, using a chair. So we just quickly started, the mandate from the office was to make it really lightweight. So we started exploring, uh, first off, the higher level geometry of the piece. So a lot of the structural action would be um, compensated by, by the higher level geometry. Um, figuring out ways to generate this geometry, you know, using things like form relaxation to improve the structural performance of the surface. But it was very, uh, very quick exercise just to get a relatively accurate neighborhood of geometry. The next step, obviously, again, we've seen this today, is this idea of topology optimization, which is you load the chair with the structural loads that we think will be operated on it, someone sitting down, basically. Um, and you give it certain parameters, like the weight you want to load it with, where the weight is going to be applied, right? Where, where the weights are going to be applied, how much weight is being applied. And it starts to remove and um, emphasize certain areas, right? So the simple FEM-based uh, optimization, where it's d displacing material properties uh, sh and showing you where material is important and at what level. So um, I, similar to the Mexico piece, we didn't want to punch holes into this. Again, it's a chair, people have to sit on it. And we were looking for a more interesting way to describe this information in the chair. So what ended up happening is we basically baked the structural information into the chair's mesh. 
and we went through an exercise of trying to figure out how to use that information. So one straightforward thing for us to do was to use the information to kind of um, scale, I guess, the mesh property of the face size, which is just showing, allowing us to distribute material in a very easy way, at first off. Just where there is no need for material, we have a simple web. Where there is need for material, it eventually closes down into a solid structure again. And the other layer was just to allow it to, um, in a gradient way, describe the depth of the structure. Right? So two very simple moves. What, what became an interesting exercise for us, actually, more than that, was trying to correlate the optimization results with the mesh. Um, I'm not sure how many of you have had this problem, um, but for us, it's a very common recurring problem in the office that you do all these kind of um, high-resolution based methods. And anyone who's tried to design these kind of things know high resolution is not your friend in these cases. What is your friend is this idea of a low fidelity mesh, which is just another word for a low polygon. And you're trying to find quick ways to rebuild this mesh in a way in which the mesh flows follow the structural optimization. So there was a lot of um, hoop jumping to go through to get to this point which I won't go through in detail, but essentially the main uh, task of this stage is to go from an unbiased subdivision mesh, which we're all familiar with, with its problematic singularities, et cetera, to a structurally aligned mesh where the inherent flows of the mesh kind of already somehow resemble the structural flows from the optimization result. So it's this kind of original mesh, structural flow polygon to structurally aligned mesh, right? This is a simple median axis rebuild strategy. From there, we're able to get a mesh which we're reasonably happy with, where the faces are, where the flows of the mesh match up with the structural action. We're able to scale these faces uh, based on that information and create uh, a more, um, uh, what's the word, equal flow of, of this information rather than these sudden breaks in the stru structural transition. And what you're seeing here in terms of color was our first guess at how we would you know, gradate the printer properties. Right? So the idea was that in areas of depth, we would print with their harder ABS plastic. In areas of the webbing, we would print in the softer, more flexible plastic available to us through the printer. Right? So simple, straightforward um, approach. We, and then, you know, Stratus came back and said, this is how we want the information. You had to break it up into multiple layers with each layer assigned a material. So if any of you have used the Connex printer, you know, or any voxel-based printer, you know this is how it works. You give it certain layers and you name the layer, or you tell them this layer is this material, and they put it together and print it out for you. So this became and this is a small one to two scale model we had printed out of them, right? So you can see here, uh, unfortunately, because of the state of 3D printing, most of that print is support material, right? All that red stuff is just support material. And the idea for this chair was this would become an on-demand print. So this was something the office wanted to do that we could on the fly design the thing custom for a client, print it out ship it to them, you know, uh, take, the idea was that it would take a short while. Uh, unfortunately, the one-to-one -one print takes 700 hours, apparently. But um, we're working on that. Uh, again, you see the primary reason is because of the support material. So the current exercise, this project's not finished. This is still the goal to finish it. The current exercise is how to drastically reduce support material in the print. But you know we're making progress. This is the one to two scale model where you can start to see the gradation of materiality in the print. Um, we, you, know, you, you can structurally test this as much as you're comfortable with. In the end of the day, you don't want to break this piece. Um, but we are working. This is a, a recent one to one sample we received from them regarding treatments and how you can actually see it's a impressive um, technology, like how they can gradate this materiality. So like I'm saying, th this project is still in process. Um, hopefully, you'll see it soon, the one-to-one -one scale chair. Um, what came apparent to us really quickly is that this was a very uh, data-heavy process. 
Um, the more we talk about these kind of materiality projects, the more we talk about this way of fabricating projects, it's very different than the old days where you would model this low polygon, subdivide it, and put some tiles on it, and then the tiles go to DP or what. You, know, you, you guys know this flow, right? And there's just a whole bunch of tiles that need to export. But um, the more and more fabrication technology is being integrated into early stage design, as designers, we're tackling more and more with this data problem. So it became clear to us that we need to address this and find out ways to um, help us in, in moving forward quicker. And I, I know there are a few talks today that are s somehow positioned in the same territory. So I'll be, again, just going over this stuff in a higher level. So um, I think this, everyone understands that you need to engage materiality as a material problem. You need to understand its properties. You need to understand how it works. And it's a process, maybe not at this scale, but it's a process that architects and designers are familiar with for a long time, right? How to engage material at the material level. With something like the Stratsys project, we were starting to think about we have to engage material at the, this other level, which is this data space level, right? How does um, this kind of information uh, allow itself to be uh, used to find quick, essentially quick heuristics that allow us to make assumptions about how the material will behave. And because it's a heuristic, we can quickly act on it and make assumptions, right? So this was just a quick exercise we did in the office. I'll just take you through. Um, this is something a lot of us are familiar with. It's just particle integration in a vector field, right? Particles. Um, moving on a mesh, let's say, trying to achieve, trying to follow gravity, trying to get to the bottom. And they're very quickly, um, in a sense, uh, let's say they're coloring the mesh on the right based on their visiting values. Their behavior is he heavily guided by certain information, right? Like, uh, that is a quick approximation of uh, a structural test. And we used a simple test like this with many, many properties to create a data set, right? So you just create a whole bunch of these simulations, and you create uh, a data set that you start to use to make uh, research or analysis assumptions. And the first step we did was to break this thing down into its eigenspace. I'm sorry, I, we, I don't think we have time to go through it, but it's essentially you're trying to find the base uh, sh type of data patterns that describe this data set. So if any of you are familiar with like facial recognition, this is how it's done. They take a sample of a population. There was this thing on Facebook two years ago where they showed the average face in India, the average face in Russia. Did you guys see this? So, so um, it's essentially how it works, right? What are the average data patterns in, an, in, an, in a Russian population? What is the average data patterns in this data set, right? It's a similar approach. It's the first level of abstraction required to do a lot of things, and that's what we're kind of doing. You're breaking that data set into its component parts, essentially. And to give you an intuitive understanding of it, um, if you look at the top mesh on the top left, it's a human being walking. And what you're trying to do is find the primary axis of the variation of the information. Right? So if you look at the human being uh, standing up, the axis or the vector that describes the most variation in that person is the vertical axis. Right? And what you're trying to do is squash all that information onto that axis. So in this case, what is a three-dimensional da three data problem gets squashed into a two-dimensional data problem, which I, I hope uh, you guys realize the advantage is that it just makes it easier to look at something that's 2D rather than 3D, right? And so you can look at, in a sense, squashed information. So the mesh on the top right is represented by the graph on the bottom. It's just squashing the data, finding the principal axis of variation and squashing up upon it. So using this, we were able to build simple um, plots of the variation of the data across our, across our data set. So we're able to represent this data set like this. And if any of you have used Excel or anything like this, you know that you can fit a curve through a data model. right? And by fitting a curve through a data model, it's called like regression. You can do it in Excel. You can do it in many pre prefigured libraries these days. But you're fitting a curve, 
and then you can basically predict new simulations. So what you can see here is you have your simulation on the top left and our prediction on the top right. And the bottom with the Y and the Y hat, you can see the, what is that color? The cyan and the blue, the cyan is the simulation data and the blue is the prediction data. And you can see they're actually quite similar. They're 92% similar. And the advantage here is, we're not doing this just to do it, is a simulation takes approximately 125 seconds based on your methods of calculating. Do you speed it up, et cetera? A prediction takes 0.1 of a second. Right? So you can iterate incredibly fast. And that is something you need in an office uh, of this scale. You want to be able to simulate, iterate, simulate, iterate, design based on that knowledge. Because these methods, only through iteration do you gain intuition. Right? And, uh, designers primarily operate, like us at least, we primarily operate on this intuition, right? not on hard facts. We do later on, but in the beginning, the early stage design, you're operating mostly on your design intuition. Um, something that we noticed really quickly here is that where we're operating on a global level, we were able to produce these data-wide predictions. But a lot of times what we want to do is build local level simulations. So we moved on to this next idea, again working off the concepts of facial recognition, which is this idea of pixel importance. So what you're seeing on the left-hand side is um, what are the areas that are the most important in a, in a human face towards predicting that face. So you can see these bright spots, areas around the eyes, areas under the nose. Those pixels are more important in identifying a person than the rest, right? And it's the same thing in the mesh. You can start to look at this at a very local vertex level about who's more important than who. And using this kind of information, you can build a probability-based model of the neighborhood. So the advantage here is you can now predict vertex neighborhood rather than having to go through the whole simulation and predicting the whole simulation, right? So this is something called Bayesian probability. The advantage of Bayesian probability is that it's independent. You don't need all the data to make the prediction. You can make, it, make like subsection predictions. And what this allows you to do is what you see here. Just by extracting a vertex neighborhood, you can make a prediction. And again, you can see here simulation prediction based on the same method. And what we did here is just go vertex by vertex and build a model for it. And it's incredibly fast, and it's much easier because you can then zoom in on the mesh and increase the resolution of accuracy. So for us, this was a useful exercise to think about how to address these design problems. And really quickly, we'll take you through an ongoing project we're doing. Uh, we started it in Acadia over summer, which is a conference. And we had set up a workshop with Form Labs, who are this independent startup who builds these laser sintering uh, 3D printers. They essentially gave us four printers and like do whatever you want uh, in the workshop. So one way was we just let our students print stuff out. Right? And the other thing is like we have four printers. We have 20 students. Let's build the data set. Right? So uh, Vishu just quickly generated a really quick way of generating uh, point clouds. In this case, it's just a particle spring model growing, and you're just registering the particle locations in space. So it's just a parameter-controlled model. There was no in not much intelligence to it. It's just we give it out to students. They can play with that easily. It's just a two-and-a-half-day workshop, right? And the next step was to build um, nearest lowest trees. So how, 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 the, how vectors would flow through that point cloud. And using that information, you can generate these kind of meshes. Right? Some really fast exercise. Uh, the design is, in a sense, not that important. It's just about producing these kind of bodies. And then going through a very quick exercise of trying to figure out metrics for these bodies. So uh, clustering is one, trying to find the best fit clustering to explain this data without having to look at the shape, right? Is this a four, five cluster body, a six cluster body, et cetera? Things like network centrality, where are the areas of the body where the most information flows through, et cetera? And obviously the most important one was the print metric, like does, did this thing print or not, right? Did it break? Huh? Yeah, did it print or not or does it not work? So I just quickly go through it. 
and then we were extracting uh, information from their print software, such as volume before and after support material, how long it would take, et cetera, et cetera. And using this, you can very quickly build uh, a 3D printing metric, right? Uh, what is the parameter that created the shape? What are the data metrics of the shape? Did it print? What were the print times? What were the print volumes, et cetera? And what we, we can now do um, is you're essentially trying to find correlation in the data. And what we're trying to do is then identify families of shapes that somehow we don't know why yet print better than others, right? And the data predicts that these will print better. These will not fail, or these will fail at less, uh, at the less likelihood, right? or they'll print with better surface quality, et cetera, things like this. So I guess the main thing to take away from this is that we're, we're trying to look at these problems in a different way. We're still thinking about uh, applying these methods to early stage design. We're just trying to figure out ways to approach this problem in, in a novel, novel way, let's say, right? a different way. So thanks. <laughs> Next two speakers um, are Alexandros Tsamis, who is going to be showing his work from uh, the PhD that he did at MIT in Boston. And then after that, there's going to be Francis Bitonti showing his work from his studio in New York. So, Alexandros is first. Well, thank you very much also for the invitation. The, the idea of, of having a community and discuss each other's work for me is uh, fantastic in this topic, which is kind of uh, newly forming. I'm going to show you the work that I did in my PhD at MIT between 2007 and 2011. It's a little bit dated, but I hope it works for the, for the conference. In the architecture of the well-tempered uh, the, the well environment, Rainer Banham in, uh, kind of asks us to consider a tribe's dilemma. He says that when a tribe inhabits a forest and they have wood, they have one of two options. They can either uh, cut the wood and be build envelopes around them to protect themselves, or they can burn the wood and make fire. In other words, tampering with the environment's meteorology. This dilemma, of course, is rather fake, because why not do both? But it is, in principle, the idea that when societies started to form and when they had to deal with how to engage with, you know, with, their, with their environment, how to think of space, they could either think of it as a composition of envelopes or they could think of it as uh, manipulating or tampering with the energies of that environment. And for me, this distinction in theory, is important. It's buzzing, no? 
uh, is important because, and I'm going to keep this distinction throughout this presentation, basically when we think of architecture, when we think of th uh, the um, production of architecture, we can either think of it in terms of boundaries, in terms of elements, envelopes, as uh, uh, Banham says, or we can think of it in terms of properties, in terms of energies, which include material and immaterial uh, energies. Uh, in uh, material science and engineering, the reemergence of uh, composite materials came with techniques in which those composite materials are we've seen in many of the presentations before, uh, uh, happen with material variation in their bodies. In other words, objects have different properties which are not the result of assembling different pieces together. In, it is a result of varying mat locally material properties. And beyond the technical pragmatics, the efficiencies that these things uh, kind of put forward, even for our discipline, which are important, I think, today, what is important to me is that they shift the attention of understanding the way architecture can be thought of. And I think to resurface that distinction that Banham put forward like 40 years ago is important. And my interest as a designer doing this PhD was, okay, there is this newly uh, forming proposition. Let's think of space as uh, uh, distributing material properties and how does this become manipulable for me? How can I use it? How can I uh, engage with it? In order to explain what that means, um, we know the story of uh, topology and we know the story of Greg Lynn and uh, the pliable object and so on. This story was facilitated by mathematics and by kind of a series of tools and a series of computations and a, a series of, of theoretical mathematics that started from Darcy Thompson that, took about, that talked about topology, about species, variation, and so on. So that concept of a pliable entity that corresponds to its environment somehow became manipulable as a concept through these kinds of computations. So I set out to make a mathematical model kind of a computation for materials. That's why the lecture is called the mathematics of material. How can I come up with a similar idea that deals with properties in space? Um, if, if we look at all the tools that we have in our disposal today, uh, we, will, we will notice that uh, they work with boundaries. They work with elements that are boundaries. They have hierarchical uh, relationships between them. We have points, lines, surfaces, and solids, and they come at this with this kind of um, uh, relationship between them. Points are boundaries of lines. Lines are boundaries of surfaces. Surfaces are boundaries of uh, solids. Properties do exist in this kind of software, which we call boundary representation software in general, but they come as attachments. They come as afterthoughts. So a simple assignment of a color is on a boundary object. A, a, a material is usually, in a rendering software, is a texture or it is an image that you attach to it. In finite element analysis, you need a boundary representation first, and then you calculate on top of that the material properties or the, the properties, the behaviors, the performance that this thing has. Even if we have something like Ecotect, which is a very useful tool, nevertheless, this relationship between uh, a boundary and property exists there too. You import a geometry into uh, Ecotect, Ecotect calculates for you something like daylight, like performance. It gives you some sort of a property reading. That is an attachment on a boundary. It is an afterthought. If you need to change it, you can't change the thing there. You can't change the behavior, basically. You can only change the geometry, which you take outside of Ecotect. You change it, and you come back in. So. Vspace, the project that I'm presenting to you today, is trying to do exactly that. It's trying to switch the relationship between property representations and boundary representations. And I call Vspace a property representation software. The first thing that is important to consider when we have these kinds of computations are the, the space they're in. In, in the typical boundary representation software, this is the Cartesian coordinate system. For this space, um, I'm using voxels, which you might have heard. If you, if you haven't, they're just uh, minimal units 
that are equivalent to pixels in 2D, like you have in Photoshop. Uh, but voxels are not new. They have existed for a long time in architecture. And uh, Lionel March, uh, in his Geometry of the Environment, says that they started in 1936 in architecture with BEMIS, a guy that, whose modular coordination study kind of introduced minimal spatial entities, which he called cubelets, to describe form and to describe any kind of built entity. The idea for BEMIS was that there was industrial production, there was standardization, there was unitization of everything, so why don't we try to come up with a computation that accommodates that standardization and unitization? Lionel March, who, ex who extended this work in the 60s and the 70s, kind of generalized it and showed us, for example, how you can derive different kinds of combinations of voxels from an empty one to a complete one and counted how many, in a given set, how many of those different ones we can have. He then went on to describe different buildings as matrices, zeros and ones basically, voxel on, voxel off, cubelet on, cubelet off, and so on. And he, talks, he talked about sets or about multi-modules which were the architectural elements like doors, windows, uh, cabinets, uh, parts of walls, and all these kinds of things that would all conform to the logic of standardization. The logic of, uh, I have this type of material, I have this truck, I have the, my machine can produce this much, this is what's gonna happen, this is how I can, I can uh, design. Bill Mitchell in the 90s wrote this book, The Logic of Architecture, and he was the one that kind of connected voxels to these kind of cubelets, and he dismissed them then, in the 90s. In my opinion, he dismissed them because exactly this kind of logic, the combinatorial logic, the voxel as a brick, is not the most efficient way whenever you have a boundary representation software, like to, de to design a wall or a window or a cabinet and so on, uh, the, the, the tools we have, the, the geometry information we have, the computations we have with boundaries are more and more efficient. So this atomistic point of view, as he says, does not prove efficient. But I think that is because the voxel in, in those days was understood as a brick, was understood as a single entity that could have a material and it is a special kind of unit. So when thinking about it today, I think that what distinguishes voxels today from voxels back then is that they are primarily information uh, placeholders. Be before they are entities, before they are objects, they are information placeholders. And this is a, this is a concept that first appeared in, uh, in medical imaging, like MRI scanning and all these kinds of things. They developed the voxel technology as we understand it today. They understand the body as a chemical environment, like these images over here show an MRI scan. And it is very important for me to look at this paradigm of how the medical imaging thing worked because it transformed the body from a mechanical system of organs, from thinking of it in an anatomical way to thinking about it in a physiological way, thinking about it as an environment, as a distribution of properties. So, in my opinion, if this shift of multi-material architecture that we're talking about today is kind of looking for a man to represent, that man I think we should find inside this uh, uh, physiological body of the MRI scan. Anyway, so this space uses a voxel space as its uh, design space. In, it's like this, it's the equivalent to the Cartesian coordinate system. Voxels are arrayed in a three-dimensional way, and they can store information with colors, and these are different properties, imagine. I have abstractly property A, density, transparency, heat, and I can assign color red to that, and that color can range from zero to 55. All different kinds of colors can range from to, to uh, the same way, and the combination of them give me the, col the, the voxel color. Also, because of the data structure, because it's a three-dimensional array, I can have neighborhoods in the von Neumann kind of way. I can look at all the voxels that are around this one, and I can tell the next voxel, I can communicate to all other ones what my state is or what my color is, and I can transfer the information back and forth. 
So this is the, this is the beginning, this is the, the point zero, this voxel space. Uh, the, the second thing that one has to consider when developing this kind of computation is methods of instantiation. This is how they're called in uh, computer jargon. The idea is that in, in software we have, we can start, we can begin by designing a point, a line, a surface, and solid, and there are methods for that. So what are the equivalent methods in a property representation software is how do you instantiate, how do you begin a property? How do you assign a property, or how do you distribute properties, basically, inside a voxel space? And the method number one is to paint. Basically, it's a very simple thing. It, you paint like with a brush by isolating a voxel, pointing at it, or by uh, isolating groups of voxels. This is a very typical thing. You've seen it in uh, Photoshop also. Another kind of way to do it is to think in a top-down kind of way. This is my voxel space, and I can assign a pattern to it, so I can associate a voxel location with a voxel color. And this is the homogeneous one, very simple one. This is like the Cartesian coordinate system, basically. This is the exact opposite. Every single voxel in that voxel space has a different color. This is a pattern, uh, slab pattern, and so on and so forth. All of these are different possible ways you can define a pattern. You can look at, you can relate a voxel location with a voxel color, and so on. You can happen in regions. You can have multiple of those kinds of things. You can have other kinds of an equation. This is a sine and cosine equation for it. This is another one that's more dense, and so on. In other ways, you can, you can interpolate. In other ways, you can, you can paint in an area, like in one layer, for example, or in, and then you can blend. You can, you can figure out a way you can interpolate between information. This is the equivalent to lofting. You loft a curve to another curve, and you produce a surface. You loft a property to another property, and you produce a volume of properties. And of, of course, the, the, the lofting has many different ways you can do it. Blending straight is, again, one way to do it. You could blend with gravity. You could blend on a curve. You could blend in many different kinds of ways. Or even you could import data from outside. Another thing that voxel, a voxel space can provide for you is that you can read physical data from outside, sensors, for example. You can take images, and you could be able to, to blend or, or to import that information and produce new information from it. All of these are instantiation methods. These are the three different instantiation methods that I could uh, come up with. The second one is how to transform, and there is this kind of category of unary transformations. These are things in software like move, copy, rotate, and scale. It, operations happening on a single object. What are those in with properties? Again, is to change the color of a property with a new one. Painting, again, works. You can have a brush, you can have a transparency, and you can change the color of something with a new one. Or, this is where the neighborhood comes in, you can describe a behavior. Uh, the behavior I chose is the behavior that was inspired uh, by Alan Turing. When I saw this, I was like very into it. Uh, he wrote this paper, The Chemical Basis of Morphogenesis, and basically he described the way with which you can put chemicals together so materials together, and by interacting, by reacting with each other, they can produce a pattern, they can produce form. So as a model of thought, this reversed the hierarchy between property and boundary. That's why I chose to use that in a three-dimensional way. Of course, it has, been ha it has happened before. It it's uses cellular automata to do it, and, uh, and, and I implemented it in uh, 3D. So beginning with a, a random distribution like this, when you give them the the, the rules of engagement, the rules of change your color according to your previous state, it starts forming three-dimensional patterns. So this is kind of an evolution of this. And then the third kind of operation that needs to take place is what we call binary transformations, which are things that in software you know them as Boolean unions, differences, and so on and so forth. It's uh, operations that combine two things together to produce a third. If you have everything as, uh, that I've said so far, you have a software because, or you have a computation because all the commands that you have in software today 
are based on those. Everything can go down to those things. So if you have property distributions, uh, you, can, you can produce a, a Boolean union by, by adding or a Boolean difference by subtracting or an intersection. You can, you can make other things, like for example, I implemented, just as an example, a diffusion analysis tool. You know the, curv the curvature analysis tool in Rhino is a software that, it's a, it's, a, it's a command that shows you how steep a curve is. It's the rate of change of curvature on a surface. There is an equivalent, there could be an equivalent with properties because properties change over time and change over space of showing you how fast or how slow a specific property changes in the, in the space. What distinguishes these voxels from being bricks to being actually information placeholders is the way you operate on them and the way you extract information from, information from them. So in my PhD, I called something a property shape, which I understand as the equivalent to a, a, a module that uh, Lionel March was talking about. But it is a query of data uh, of a complete uh, of a complete voxel space. In other words, a property shape is a subset, is a part of a complete uh, voxel space. And the operation is simple. It is asking for your software or for your computation to give you an answer to a question. Where in space is temperature 35.6 degrees? And it will show you something like this. It will carve out all the things that are not, or it will show you the things that are, right? Boundaries also exist in this kind of, uh, uh, in this kind of um, computation, but the relationship is reversed. Boundaries exist as attachments on properties. It is exactly the reverse thing that happens in, in, from the normal kind of software that we have. So if this is a property shape, which is a part, is a subset of a voxel space. This is a boundary that again answers the question where in space is blue color this much? And it gives you an answer by giving you a surface in space. All these kinds of things I told you about, instantiations, transformations, and so on, unary and binary, will happen in boundaries as well because they are permanent attachments. You can choose to show them or not show them. So the initial kind of instantiation also has boundaries associated with them. So all of these things are different boundaries. And again, a behavior also has a behavior uh, boundary. I was going through a lot of iterations because I wanted to kind of demonstrate that this can be validated as a, as a software because formally it can achieve many different kinds of things. It's not a, the, the sponge-like thing more important than the slab all of those, or the cube. All of those things can happen at the same time depending on how you manipulate the properties. This is an offset. I can uh, derive a, bound, a second boundary from a first boundary by asking the software, show me where there is a, where, there is a where, where in space is temperature 25 degrees and show me at the same time where it is 26 degrees. So that's an offset in property, which has a boundary equivalent. It is a non-uniform boundary depending, of course, depending on, the, depending on the way the offset happens but it is precise because it is precise 25 degrees Celsius and it is precise 26 degrees Celsius. It's just not precise in a Cartesian way. It is precise in a property way. So Boolean operations can happen here too, meaning that you can find the union of boundaries and the difference of boundaries and the intersection of boundaries. And of course, the last thing is that because they are, those two things exist together, boundaries and properties, you can migrate properties from the, pro the property shape to the boundary shape. So if you have a property shape and you have a boundary, you can migrate them and that's a boundary representation that has uh, information on it from the properties. This is called in my PhD a boundary shape. It's the flip side of the same coin. 
And the most difficult part, and the thing that I have been trying to engage after making this tool, is how to make sense out of it, in the sense, how, what is a valid way to isolate a property? What is a valid operation for choosing this over that? How can you make further um, uh, judgments? And I believe that the way this can happen is by associating a specific kind of uh, property with a specific type of construction method or a specific type of, of, um, of uh, material. Uh, we saw the foam in concrete, for example, earlier today. That is a very specific, it has a very specific demand. So, uh, Michael, a, a property could be a density of, uh, of foam or amount of foaming agent inside the concrete. And in that way, the way you would choose would have to do with your construction. And uh, for example, this is a boundary shape that uh, has a distribution of properties. And I chose to say that if I, if I look at the work of Peter Testa or Michael Silver, Silver that work with this uh, uh, fiber placement, carbon fiber placement, I would say that the greener the area is, the more dense the fibers would become. And that would help me continue in order to choose and in order to paint the properties the way I want them. Uh, I also did my own experiment. I chose two materials that are a polyurethane materials. One of them is a hard, rigid plastic, and the other one is an elastic one. It's like a rubber. Both of them are polyurethane, which means that they can mix. And I drew this in a two-dimensional version of my software. Uh, the blue areas were the structurally more intense areas, and the, and the orange areas were the elastic ones. And I designed them in my property representation software as a gradient between the two. I extracted the boundaries from them, and then I, and then I took this to a boundary representation software, basically, and I drew this, which then became a mold in a, in a sequence. This is kind of showing you the workflow which then became uh, a mold that I cast two successive materials, one after the other, and they made this kind of structure. The bond between those two materials here is chemical because the two materials are of similar family. So if they're still tacky or wet when you cast one on top of the other, they will actually bond together. My preoccupation is that these are two distinct states, uh, elastic or white. So I kind, of further, I kind of further wanted to develop the, a way that I can, uh, I can uh, fabricate by rethinking a little bit the way 3D printers work. In the work we saw earlier, we saw that the object 3D printing uh, uh, requires states. Where is material A, where is material B, where is material C, and so on. And in my kind of statement, voxels are not bricks. They are property placeholders. So I was trying to figure out a way I can avoid this uh, on-off kind of material and actually print in a continuously gradient uh, way. So uh, I started working on, on this uh, 3D printer uh, like back in 2006, 2007. It was funded by the Greek government, not the German government, so I couldn't finish it. But. <laughs> But uh, the idea was that we would have a mold that is a, a variable that I would, I would be able to control uh, its shape based on something that I import, like the wooden mold, but it would be digital. And then I would cast a, a piece on it. And the whole, the whole thing was that instead of having something a voxel like a brick, to have it as information, meaning if this is a boundary representation from my voxel space, and this is a trajectory that the 3D printer would get. It would basically uh, go from point A to point B by switching, the, by switching the concentrations of material A and material B. If we take the example of uh, Michael's uh, foaming, if I have concrete in one nozzle and I have foam in the other nozzle, moving from a point A to point B, I would accelerate the concrete and I would decelerate the foam, for example, mixing them together to arrive from a certain percentage in point A to a certain percentage in point B. So basically, this is all the technical stuff. And uh, to conclude, I would like to say that um, 
beyond these technical pragmatics of how we do it, what is the computation, and so on, for me it is important that this shift that we are discussing today in multi-material, this multi-material shift, which doesn't have a name yet, I think, but we're getting close, is a shift that has to do with the way in which we conceive space, in the way we understand space. And, and I would like to suggest that it is a shift that understands space as a distribution of non-homogeneous material. And it is the way we put things together that is still important. It's just that the way we put things together has changed from the traditional tectonic paradigm. And because we hear a lot about the abandonment of tectonics, Greg Lynn talks about the plastic paradigm, which is like in opposition to the tectonic paradigm. I think that tectonics is still relevant because uh, it doesn't necessarily mean assembly. It doesn't necessarily mean parts. Tectonics theoretically means the way we put things together. And yes, it means the expression of structure, but the way this expression happens is not necessarily through assembly. So I would suggest that we keep the word tectonics and we just figure out a way to express parts coming together, but not as entities, not as objects, but as properties, like in this case, for example, in this project I, I call the chunk, we have parts, but they are not things, they are not objects, they are intellections, because I have structure as, a, as an intellection, I have infill as an intellection, I have insulation as an intellection, but I don't have them as separate entities that I construct. And a way, the way I join them together is not through a mechanical way, not through bonds, but through chemistry. So this idea of, of a soft tectonic, I called it software tectonic in my PhD, I believe to, to still kind of discuss contemporary tectonics and not abandon the word, in my opinion, is, is important. Thank you. Uh, if you, do I have two minutes? One thing that I wanted to tell you is that uh, this software is on GitHub. It's open sourced. Uh, the code is there and also you can download it. Uh, just look for, for it under my name in GitHub and vSpace. And please, if anybody wants to uh, use it, change it, make it part of what they are doing and so on, feel free. Uh, it's crude, I'm not a software designer and it's not the most user-friendly thing in the world, but uh, uh, for example, this is, a, this is a, an instantiation of a, a random distribution. You can um, show all or parts of those voxels. Um, uh, this is the, over here I have two choices of behavior, as I was telling you earlier. Um, this is the, the way the behavior happens. This is a chemical behavior. It could be a structural behavior. It could be a heat behavior. It could be a liquid mixing behavior, any kind of thing that you would want. This is the way you query, like I am reducing the amount of red. Basically, I'm asking the question, don't show me the reds that are above a certain scale. Um, this is a boundary representation that happens from that. I asked it where in space is property C this much, and now I gave it also the material properties that it can acquire from the voxel space. Over here I have a, to show you how you could uh, choose a color and start painting. I, I, I made this so that you can cut the space and you can look further in if that's the idea. You can have a size. This can be augmented with other kind of functionalities as well. Look, think of uh, Photoshop. At any point, you can start and stop the calculations and so on and so forth. Um, that's it. Thank you.
doesn't need to be right in my face like that. That's good. Thanks. Okay, uh, my name is Francis Betanti. I run a design studio in Brooklyn, New York that I named after myself. Um, so we work a lot with 3D printing. We're known for what we've done with 3D printing, more or less. We're, we're a product development firm. We, we specialize in additive manufacturing. Um, but, you know, I don't think this is the next industrial revolution. Everybody keeps saying it's the next industrial revolution. It's just part of our information revolution, right? Um, it's not. Industrial Revolution had to do with usher ushering in industrialization. It brought us modernism. It brought us standardized parts. It brought us a completely different cultural context than the information age has brought us. This is part of the information age. Um, and the big paradigm shift here is that materials are information now. They're, they're, and they've always been information in some way, but now they're digital information. And we can manipulate them uh, through codified language for production or computer code or G code, right? We have, we have standardized ways of describing tool behaviors and standardized ways of describing materials, which means that we can now treat material constructions like we treat software. So materials and products and things are part of our information economy now. Um, and this changes the way we think about design on numerous levels. Um, I'm going to start off by talking to you about form, which is really where my career started. I started as an architect. Um, I thought. Well, actually, 3D printing wasn't that advanced back then. I thought this was real stuff. Um, we were making it. But really, what I was doing was I wasn't really interested in kind of creative expression or having these things look like, I don't know, a bush or a bunch of fibers. What I was really trying to do was reduce volume. 3D printing at that time was really expensive, and there was a different economy of materials, right? So this language started to come out of the limitations and economy of a means of production that was not yet part of the mainstream at that time. Um, and I started working a lot with things like this. I took a summer school with Stephen Wolfram, and um, I got really into coding and into procedural design. Um, and for a large part of my early career as a student and early professional days, a lot of what I was doing was looking really, this, these are pretty old right now, but um, just looking for a language of form that really was unique to additive manufacturing or unique to uh, what I consider to be contemporary means of production. Um, in 2005, we were, I oh, was the studio, no, 2007, sorry, we were commissioned to do bicycle rack for the DOT. Um, this is what we made. Uh, we made a $50,000 bike rack, which I guess that's why it never made it to the streets. Um, <laughs> but we tried. Uh, the whole thing was 3D printed. We, were, we 3D printed it with a company in, uh, I think they were in Eden Prairie, Minnesota. They were printing uh, car parts large car parts. Um, so we thought we could maybe try to print this bike rack. The reason I ended up 3D printing it was not because I felt it had to be 3D printed, but I couldn't make this thing any other way. And I really didn't want to carve it by hand. I didn't want to engage any craft practices. I don't consider myself an artist. Um, if it's not producible through some sort of scalable means of production, I'm not particularly interested in it. Um, so this is kind of what got me started with this technology. It was, in a sense, for me at the time, the best link to producing what, what I was drawing. Um, these are some photographs. Um, it came out really well. We made two of them. One of them got stolen. It's uh, good. At least it was desirable. That was this one. Um, I had to pay him $5 to put his bike in it. We went a little bit too far from the language of a bike rack. Um, but <laughs> it's OK. I mean, it was, it was a failure in many ways, but we succeeded in others. Um, and like I said, you know, again, what we were really early on in my career trying to do was, was develop this sort of language of production. Um, this is, as we're starting to move into fashion, this is some student work. We're using uh, flocking simulations to think about forms on the body. But what's interesting to me about this is the diversity and variation, right? When we see a lot of product customizers on the internet, um, they tend to be kind of binary sets of operations, right? You swap out one part for the other, right? So this is, it's not, that's not a shift in manufacturing. That's just, we're just learning to manipulate industrialization a little bit better. Um, but being able to create the same system that can produce wildly different formations and wildly different aesthetics like this, that is a paradigm shift for me in the means of production. Um, this is what those students made with those simulations. Um, and we've, I started the office actually in the fashion industry, so this is some early work we did for some clients uh, actually in fabric, um, doing kind of laser cut textiles for people. Uh, 
Um, so materials. This is I'm going to show some stuff that I think everybody's been showing so far today, which means there's there's some kind of common thread here. Um, this is an MRI. This is a research project that we also started with Stratasys about two years ago. Um, what I wanted to see was if we could use these multi-material printing technologies, like many of the speakers before me, to produce gradients of material. Um, I wondered, just as we could produce digital geometry from that, could we reverse engineer the process and produce STLs that had that same level of material differentiation? Um, at the time, we were working on handbags, and um, we were having a lot of trouble with the hinges. The, I don't know if you've used this technology, but the material is pretty much garbage. It falls apart. Um, you could probably get one or two or three cycles out of the thing before it's done. Um, until we did something like this, uh, right? And that just looks like static, but what that actually is is a cross-section through the hinge, right? So because we were increasing all the surface area on the bond, we weren't able to delaminate the material. And we had a working, we actually had a working hinge from what was essentially a prototyping technology and still is. Um, we expanded the research with them, and we wanted to see if we could produce like more complex material variations in the way that we use that kind of probabilistic blending um, to create a, you know, sort of structural rigidity in the hinge. Um, could we do something in a much more complex way? Uh, and this is what we fed the printer. So um, what you're going to see is a lot of different shades of pink and red. You'll see a bright red. You'll see a white. There's only two pixels in this simulation. We fed the printer a series of bitmaps. At that time, um, I don't know if the printer drivers changed much, but at that time, you could not, uh, you couldn't do things like this. You would have had to have individual shells of geometry. The files would have been massive. So we were able to compress it into a sequence of images, and they were just sort of binary bitmap files, zeros and ones. Um, and the reason you're seeing shades of pink is because you're having different microstructures which are combining those two materials, one on top of the other, which is producing material gradients. Um, These are some of the results from that print. You can see it's high resolution, but most importantly, you can see is there's no hard lines between materials, right? The assembly is a continuous differentiation from, from one durometer to the other. Uh, I'm going fast because I think I have too many slides, and it's been I think we're already over time. We can also apply this technology to do color transformations or differentiation. These are uh, some shoes that we did in collaboration with Adobe Systems last year. Uh, oh, was it this year? No, last year. Um, this is... So the factory is going to be different, too, because we can exchange information. Um, well, we can do a lot more with information than we could with industrialized processes. So this is what we're most well known for. Um, it's a couture gown for Dita Von Teese, but I'd like to talk about it in the sense of the factory, because this is what I believe industrial, well, we'll say factory production will be in the future. Um, it's made just for her. None of those dress patterns can be laid flat. They're, they're all three-dimensional curvature. Um, there's 3,000 unique articulated moving joints. No two connections are the same. That's what makes it flexible. Um, and then the couture part is it's adorned with uh, 12,000 black hematite crystals. Um, we were uh, working with a wardrobing studio in Los Angeles called Michael Schmidt Studios, and uh, it was going to be one of the first flexible 3D printed garments, and they felt very strongly that it be inspired by some sort of mathematical principle. So they asked, they sent over some sketches like this, and they asked that we use these Fibonacci spirals. Um, that works really good in 2D, but as I have a room full of architects, three dimensions is a whole different thing. Um, so we instead inverted that and we wrapped it around the body, kind of conceiving of it more like a Chinese finger st trap structure. Um, so just some of the, some of the meshes. So they, we had to work together over Skype. We never actually met these guys. Um, they didn't really have 3D modeling software in the studio, so we had to come up with a way of working very quickly. Um, this was a low mesh, low, sub, low polygon mesh, which we used the subdivisions to create the textile. Um, this was the final mesh we fed the computer, we fed the printer. Um, so the, the question we get is like a lot when I show this dress is, and I probably don't need to say this to this room, but like how do you model 3,000 unique joints? And the, the truth is you, you can't. We wouldn't have gotten it done in time. Instead, we just thought about it as a system of tilings. Um, so through mirrorings and translations and, and using that polygonal mesh to structure those deformations, um, we were able to reconstruct these sort of three-dimensional articulated structures, which we then used for the garment. 
Um, they were printed in Long Island City um, at the Shapeways factory on these EOS uh, laser sintering machines. Um, they were printed in nylon. Um, this is some photographs of the excavation process. That's a lot of dust. It's very like archaeology. Um, one of the big struggles we had cleaning this is that there were, because there were all these like tiny articulated components, cleaning out all those joints was a very labor-intensive process. Um, they were all then tagged, labeled, packed up, shipped out to Long Island City. Um, this is how they came out of the printer once they were, once they were cleaned off. Um, it's a great material. As far as 3D printing goes, it, it's my favorite. I mean, it's very strong. You can dye it like fabric. We dyed it with a fabric dye. Um, parts were then all assembled in LA. And just to give you a sense of how thin these are, that's the wall thickness on these parts. The whole dress only weighed 11 pounds um, with the corset sewn in and the crystals. So it wasn't really a heavy armor-like dress, which is like what most people think it is. Um, and it does move. It's not Photoshop. People rarely get to see this video. Um, uh, the shoulders were rigid, and then we draped the, the fabric over the, off the shoulders. It's all downhill from here, guys. Uh, this is the detail of the shoulders. Um, so the consumer. Um, one of the things we also try to think about in the studio a lot, this is another student project. But what was interesting about it was that we worked with MakerBot on it. And one of the components they wanted to look at in sponsoring that project was how they could start to build more community engagement on Thingiverse, which is their online community. Um, this is something else we'll be able to do, right? Just like you're able to share information with your friends in social networks, like you could start to use social networks as design incubators, right? Because we're abstracting material and construction into, into a data-driven model. Um, so what we built for them was, it was very simple. Uh, the platform was not that powerful at the time, but um, it allowed us to make a configurator, but we could also store that configurator so people could save their results. Um, in the cloud, and then other users on the network could then write comments, make it themselves, download it, do what they want with it. Um, it was a platform for sharing variation, design variations. Um, more on this idea of community. Um, about a year ago, we did a project with 3D Hubs when they launched, uh, a little bit after they launched. Um, we wanted to really push this idea of a distributed factory. Um, could a factory exist in the cloud? Um, there were 76 hubs that we chose out of their network. Um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with how they work, but it's kind of a community ranking system for fabrication hubs. So we could tell, we took the top ranking, everybody had five star ranking out of their system, and we said they were approved to produce our products. Um, we then provided a customizer interface. Um, for people to shop, you could adjust really up. We only wanted to give them the ability to adjust the texture of the surface. Um, it rendered itself in the browser real time. After you found a configuration you like, you would add it to your shopping bag and you type in your zip code. And then we used the 3D Hubs API to route them to a local production hub um, where each hub would then set their own price and they would coordinate with the customer. I'm going to jump this because it just shows what the customizer just showed. Um, so one of the ambitions with this project was to produce things that could be entirely printed at home. So that was a big challenge with the application, was that we didn't want any post-processing. A lot of these had complex structures. We didn't want any support materials. Um, they were designed to be made on desktop printers. some of the vases. All right, and that's all I have to say. Thank you, guys.
Okay, it's good by me. First of all, uh, th thank you very much for the range uh, and you know wealth of ideas and range of uh, presentations uh, in the morning. I, I, I shall perhaps kick start the conversation, and I would like, of course, to open it up to the audience as quickly as possible. But um, it, it seems that under you know, the umbrella term of multimateriality, there's quite a lot of uh, different ideas no, coming through. We've seen a different paradigms of space, a different paradigms of material, we've even seen a different role of authorship, I suppose, in this idea of an open source, of not open source, but open platform, where you can um, uh, design uh, your own objects, or even different idea of aesthetics and ornament and relationship between structures. So it is perhaps a, a, a slightly broad question, but I was wondering whether you think that um, the role of the architect, the, your kind of professional figure, if you like, has been uh, affected or changed by all the, uh, the possibilities that manufacturing and softwares in combinations have, have given you. So do you, f you, do you feel that you are like a traditional architect or do you think that this is perhaps the beginning of a new breed of uh, architecture or architecture profession? I mean, I, I always say I hope I'm putting myself out of business. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think on, on one level, there's there's this kind of nice dream that, wow, well, maybe not. I think, you know, I think one of the things that we're doing is, like, with a lot of these code-driven techniques is we're dropping the kind of barrier of entry for a lot of people. Um, I don't think the, the profession of design will go away, but I think there's a, you know, I think in a lot of ways we're building tools that are, that are lowering the entry point. same things uh, exist uh, today. The, the idea of multi-materiality, uh, in my opinion, doesn't shift in intellections, basic assumptions about architecture. In my opinion, uh, uh, for example, um, uh, Catherine Ingraham was writing about the biological she was saying, regardless of this biological paradigm in which components or pieces or architecture is almost alive, the brain still needs to work with parts and still needs to work with relationships between them. So in, in history, like all the, all the different approaches to what tectonics is, has always dealt with how the relationship between the parts of the whole or how do we put things together or how do we express a, an idea through a material construct was always just that this multi-material shift that we're discussing today has a different means and a different vocabulary and a different and a different technology that gets associated with it. And what I was trying to say, I also, in terms of, there's another thing that uh, I, uh, Greg Lynn says it very well, that architects are primarily form givers, they are not form finders, because there was this mm -hmm. thing about form finding at some point, and because we have all these tools that kind of tell us how gravity works and we use simulations and all these kinds of things still as architects we are not we are we are, we cannot abide to any single rule that says this is how it should work or this is how it should be he says it very well we are primarily form givers it's the way we give the world it can change over time and can have different kinds of expressions and different kind of technologies that support it in my opinion, the idea that there is a part of all relationship, even in multi-material architecture, is still important. Uh, the, uh, we, I think we're witnessing a, trans a transition from what we call a part, a material part or a tectonic part, to chunks, which are 
multi-material monolithic bodies, but within them, parts as interactions or as, as functions still exist, and we still need to deal with how they relate to, the, to each other from an aesthetic point of view, from a practical kind of functional point of view, and from a material point of view. Mm -hmm. That's it. <laughs> Please, yeah. uh, in my opinion, it brings disciplines uh, more together uh, mm -hmm. again. I'm an engineer, uh, but I'm working closely with uh, architects uh, on the digital model. Also, I need the mechanical engineer for, for the manufacturing, and even I need the material scientists, and all together working on the same model. So, so I think uh, uh, because it's uh, working on the same model together, uh, we have the same basis and, and start talking more to each other. And it's one design process. You cannot split it up in uh, phases and papers. Okay. Yeah, I think for me personally, it's maybe the topics change or the focus is changing, but not so much, let's say, the methodology. So saying you're classical architects, you design buildings, you draw block lines, etc., going from an urban scale down to, let's say, a furniture scale. In this case, it's just being more or less reversed. You go from the smallest kind of molecule up to, let's say, an idea of tectonics. So the steps and the methodology is still similar or the same, so you don't have to forget everything that you learned previously. It's just a set of thinking that you basically are educated with and that stays with you. And that sense you also evolve over time and your personal interests. So I think it's uh, an architect maybe it's a bit more towards a designer now. But I think, you know, to your comment though, I think there is a really dramatically different I mean, maybe this isn't what you're saying, but I think there is a dramatically different approach to tectonics embedded in this, and that, you know, because it's so discrete, it's almost, there's a, there's a universality in, in the methods, whereas like the, 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 the shift between like, you know, this sort of linear hard line and some of the things you were showing today mm -hmm. is, is, is really nothing, right? It's nothing to make that translation. So it's like, I mean, yes, there is still a sense of tectonics, but it's, it's, it's fragile and almost really artificial in a sense, like what this sort of like articulation between components really is. Um, it's purely a cultural projection. Well, the, the, the word tectonics is a very slippery one because it has over time acquired many different kinds of things. Uh, uh, Frampton and Antoine Picot, for example, when they discuss it, they say it is the expression of structure. There's also another kind of definition which is the transition from structure to construction, which means the things that are, you put, how you put things together in architecture, in the design process, and how you translate those into constructed entities. But the construction method and the way you intellectually conceive of something can be the it's not a it's not a one-way thing so what I was trying to say before that if you in your project you're thinking of a trans a pink material and a white material they represent some sort of a performance that might be distinguished one from another correct and one of them could be associated with something that you would traditionally think of as structure <coughs> being a column and so on right. but it is a structural it is a the function of structure sure. or the, the intellection of structure still exists. Sure. That's why I'm saying that there is a relation. Yeah. It's just a completely different in the yeah. way it's expressed. I understand that, but the, the articulation of geometry for one purpose or the other is, it becomes arbitrary, right? Like there's not really a ne necessary need for one versus the other. I mean, to me, it's like kind of like a virtual reality problem, right? Like if we actually get to a point, like we have nanobots in our brain, like what do things look like? It's just what we want them to look like. There's not necessarily a material pressure that's dictating what something looks like versus doesn't look like anymore. Okay, but we have to acknowledge that gravity still exists. Hopefully sure, but like, today. like you know, like it does, there's no tool making me make a certain fillet. There's nothing like there's no like as far as the like the articulation of form, mm -hmm. which is what you know architects have always really, I mean, in, in many respects, built practices on mm -hmm. is developing kind of formal languages. Mm -hmm. There, there's no material or production driven pressures anymore dictating that tectonic. They're, they're, yeah. they're, they're entirely cultural and virtual mm -hmm. in this situation. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we could go further. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's certainly, uh, I think what it definitely emerges is that there is a, I think it was pointed out in several 
presentation that the, 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 the paradigm under which we read space is one that is can be transformed by the fact and I'm moving towards perhaps another area of discussion that I would like to share with you uh, by the close relationship between computational tools and material production and that is another area that I think is uh, you know the reference the constant almost reference in most presentation to MRI scan and that kind of technology is beginning to of course show that computational tools allow us to see space differently or we construct it in a way that could allow us to show space differently and therefore also materialize it differently. So I suppose I wonder whether you have anything to share on basically software as a material itself in, in the design process and where do you think software uh, will go or could be uh, further developed in order to integrate between let's say the computational side of your work and the material kind of materialization I suppose of your work so where do you think that kind of uh, side of your of software could go uh, next or you would like to see it going next start off again I guess. <laughs> um, well I think we've run into this problem in the studio because uh, what we've found is that most CAD packages are, are surface modelers and, and they're not very good at describing high surface area mm -hmm. pieces like we're creating um, and we found that what we really need are volumetric modelers so we've there aren't really a lot of commercial packages out there right now. They're starting to pop up, but we need like voxel platforms. We've just recently invested a lot of time in, in getting some open source technologies integrated into, into what we're doing in the studio because they're, we were hitting really serious walls and very, very long times to model things and seeing what things looked like. Um, so we, we needed voxel software. And I, I think that's, at least for the next 10 to 20 years, going to be what the, the we're going to need to run yeah. the studio. Well, I have, uh, I think my, 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 the topic of my discussion yeah. was how the, like I, I have my version of how software <laughs> would become if we are to be uh, dealing with uh, multi-material architecture. I don't know, I'm using this term, I don't know if it's, but anyway. But in general, software is a, requires a type of computation or a type of mathematical model behind it always. And any kind of mathematical model is always a reduction so it cannot really one-to-one -one relate to the physical world. And we have to deal with this reduction uh, in our day-to-day -day practices. This is what we understand as representation, basically. Yeah. And uh, representation is a form of uh, reduction, among other things. And it's a, it's a kind of a tricky situation, because on one hand, you reduce the world into the things, into the components that you can understand, like All the geometric solids, for example, are reductions of the, like, who was it? Uh, Derrida or Hassel was writing about the origins of geometry yeah. that societies were forming and they were observing things and slowly things were morphed into becoming the sphere and the, and the cube and the rectangle and so on. And they were always approximations at the beginning. And those, by the way, included some other characteristics of them, like smells and materials and so on. So perhaps we can revisit that too yeah. as, a, as a concept. But um, the reductions are different in, in the reductions that need to take place in, in the composite paradigm are different than the ones that have existed in the software industry so far. And at the same time, it's those reductions that are actually give us the creative potential to see the world in a different way and work in a different way as well. So it is, a reduction is not necessarily a bad thing. I'm not sure if there needs to be uh, one, one software which uh, is solving it all. I think it's more a question about the, the, the interfaces because uh, for, for all our problems we, we all found a, a good uh, software for, for the spe special problem but uh, sometimes there are problems uh, with exchanging uh, and with the interfaces mm -hmm. so uh, yeah, it, it, there's uh, a lot of development to be done uh, to, to find an easy interface for <coughs> the techniques that I used were pretty straightforward to be yeah. honest, so in that sense not as advanced as these guys. <laughs>
But of course, new software is always great, and I'm definitely <laughs> going to play with the tool that he set up to see what I can get out of it. Yeah. All right. If, uh, I suppose we can open it up to the floor. Perhaps um, Costas has a microphone, so um, he can amplify your questions. Can I ask? Yes. Um, I was just wondering when you like um, when you design like uh, so far. I think uh, there's this kind of phenomenon where you actually design with no material in mind uh, sometimes. When you actually get what you design into the computer to be fabricated, what is fabricated for me is something that could be called a representational materiality. It represents a material. You, you cannot really design in the computer and 3D print something into full scale at the moment. So whatever you actually fabricate is something that is uh, material, but in a smaller scale of what it should be, uh, if that makes sense. So I was just kind of wondering, I mean, I, I take the point about the aesthetics being part of how you design and how do you compute voxels and so on and so forth. But um, I was just wondering how important is it to bring material properties back into the software and into the computer when you design with them? Because for example, I mean, red and blue they m might have some kind of aesthetic, uh, let's say, affinity between them, like a, in the eye of the designer. But th when they actually represent accurate materials, materially then might not be compatible. Mm -hmm. So how do you, how important do you think is to be able to compute this compatibility? As I was trying to say, as I was trying to say earlier, there is always when when you have a computation, you have a reduction, and when you have a reduction, you have like a, you leave out the things that you cannot include in your reduction, and a material is is a thing, stuff that you can smell, you can you can hit your head on, you can eat and die. There are so many kinds of things that you cannot include. In, a, in a, any kind of computation because you cannot, you cannot have the universal thing of everything. There's no such thing. So it is important to coordinate your reduction with your ability to understand it. And because contemporary, like the CAD software that we have today, like the boundary, the surface modelers, they have a lineage of starting from the tracing paper and the, and the compass and the, We've had like, like, I don't know, 500, 600 years of, uh, of dealing with what does a surface mean or what does a line mean and how you can understand the inside and the outside and so on. It's, it, it kind of became part of the DNA of, architect, of an architect to understand the drawing. And we keep pushing this, we keep pushing this, but it's, it's always going to be a reduction. There's nothing about material in a line. There's nothing about material in a point. But there is material in a wall and there is material in architecture today. And we've managed to do it so far. It's, it's going to happen. It's going to keep going. That's what I believe. <laughs> disagree. <laughs> so my disagreement. Um, so for you know for us in the studio, it's it's a question of like what I've become very interested in is the is the translation from a digital file, let's say like a STL, into into G code, right? There's 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 another intermediate piece of software called a slicer that does that conversion, and that's that's where like a lot of my attention has been drawn lately. Because if we're going to produce material, novel material kind of situations and effects, it happens in that step from when you go to a, a geometric representation to, to, tool, to tooling. Um, and, and, and you know, you very much have to think about material in that step. And, and a line very much means, translates directly into a material property. You know, like when in that step, like a vector means the tool's gonna go this way, which means the material will follow that and it has a temperature and it has, it has all the kind of chemical properties that are gonna give the material its physical properties. So no, a line is not plastic, but it represents plastic. And that's what designers have always dealt with. And, and that's... So we agree fully. But <laughs> no, but I think it's not. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we're talking about it in a different way, but... Um, but yes, it, you, I think. You, but I think you can simulate a material. I think you can. You can contain as much information as you might need. And I don't need to know if someone's going to choke on it and die in ten years. And it's not my job. You know. I, I, I guess maybe. I mean, the, the point I was trying to make, maybe, because what you're kind of referring to is like singular material that you already know that this is going to be the output of what you're designing into the computer. When, when you actually, I mean, 
relating back to the theme of the kind of symposium as well about this idea of multi-materiality, when you expand, let's say, the palette of materials that you can use, then I would guess that you do need the computer and the software that you're using to tell you whether two materials can be compatible into some multi-material construct that you're going to make. So I think maybe it might not be kind of entirely necessary at the moment because we have a very limited amount of stuff that we can do, but when this expands, I would guess it would be necessary at some point. It's an interesting problem, and I think it's actually largely geometric, because we've worked with multi-material printing both like in FDM technology and with the, the, <coughs> the photopolymerization methods. And in the photopolymerization methods, it's not a problem, because you're, you're restricted to resins that are going to be they're compatible and capable of joining. But like, if you're trying to extrude two different materials, like it actually really becomes a geometric problem, and it becomes a question of how you structure those relationships. You know, because you might have like one or, well, not say one, but like let's say you have 16 micron kind of control over that filament, like you can start to create looping patterns and weaving patterns and things that go in and out of each other. And, and it, it becomes a kind of micro scale geometric problem that I think that you can solve. And it's not built into software today, but it is something that designers are very well suited to be working on. Because um, they are actually big scale assembly problems that we can scale down now. And there's not quite enough work being done there. I think it would be most important to, to have the materials included uh, in the computation models from the beginning. Mm -hmm. That in, in the end, uh, if you give the computer the choice, uh, it will figure out the right material at the right position. And if the material properties are, are right in the computer, then it, it can be built. Uh, uh, but the, the, there's a lot of, uh, if you're not having the, the, the material properties uh, when, you, when you started uh, designing, then you end up with a design and then you need to think about, okay, what material can I, can I use? So you're not including the material in the design process. You know, there's this software called CES, which is, uh, was developed, I think, here at MIT. It's a, it's a database of all materials that exist and all the processes that exist, and it, keep, it keep, keeps expanding. It started in 2000 idea for a computational uh, tool it would be to figure out a way to connect that database with a kind of a, a property kind of uh, representation uh, tool that would allow you to want to, to, to check every time you draw something to go to the pool of materials and say okay this one will work that one will not work this is not compatible with that that has this uh, transparency this Young's modulus and so on and so forth so it kind of becomes a more sharing of different platforms. That's an idea how if everybody wants to work on it. Please go ahead. All right, any questions from the others? I have a question, actually. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I think I'm loud enough questions. <laughs> no, not loud enough. Thank you very much for um, everything, all the fantastic work that you've showed. My question is, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in all the things that you've presented, and I've done my personal research on it uh, uh, during my uh, master's. The question is, are we missing something here? Because everything that uh, you've discussed, and we've all researched, and we've all discussed, and people that are interested in that field under understand that multimateriality is different than um, a graded material, right? It's, it's using, let's say, two different materials that they would not be used in nature and bonding them together, generating a third material that has properties in it, from one material to the other and, the, and the, all the middle states. So are we missing something out? Because we're all here mostly involved either in engineering or in architecture. So my question is, the, the combination of those two happens in a molecular level, or at least we want to imagine that it happens in a molecular level. So we go far from geometry. It's not how you combine them geometrically, but it's how you combine their properties together. Mm -hmm. So my question is, who, where is the field? What field would be the one that we would benefit from? Is it chemistry? Is it biology? Is it who, who are the people that we can actually uh, benefit from and help us out in this sort of journey and endeavor that we're setting up? talking about a very new thing, and I don't really know who to go to, to be honest. I think it, it's going to be a, a 
have to be a mixture of disciplines, you know. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Fair, fairly new thing is, uh, is, is not that new in terms of... Uh, but Maybe not academically. Uh, I mean, in, in the commercial world, it's a yes, very new no, thing. No, what I'm saying is <laughs> that, that uh, composite materials uh, have a history. Like, there's a book called Lightness. Uh, it came out in 2002, something like this. It's a Dutch, I think, authors. I don't remember the name. It tells you the history of composite materials, and one of the most important characteristics of composite materials since antiquity was the fact that, that they could exhibit non-homogeneous uh, properties. They could be mixtures. They have examples of the samurai sword, for example, is a, is a popular one we see around. A Turkish bow, Turkish, but good, is a, is a bow that uh, is also a composite kind of structure. There's a lot of examples from antiquity. Today, they reserve the, since the 90s, this idea of functionally grading a composite material has been around. And the, the chemists study, study it because they have to deal with the lamination. Uh, material scientists uh, study it, engineers uh, study it. There's a, a huge amount of work in the scientific community, engineers basically, about how to combine materials together. Uh, uh, if you want to talk to, to liven the thing up and talk about uh, biology as well, probably in biology there is some synthetic biology going on today in the biology field and some in architecture as well that deals with combining graded materials together. But For us, He's talking about like nanoscale assembly. I, am I am I, am I, am I misunderstanding? Yes. Yeah, like you're you're talking about something that none of us have presented here, nor have we entered into but that it's territory. The base of everything, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because it, uh, you know, there was an image that was taking the from the timber situation to an aluminum or a metal. This is the basis of everything because it's not a geometrical problem. It's a problem of how actually you bring those molecules together, and if one can. And that's going to be something that's going to be solved by by what nanotech field industry is doing but it's you know there's not enough minds on it right now and I think this is and I know we can say it's been done before in antiquity but you know like until there's like a, a platform available that can <coughs> lower the standard of entry for, for people to start working on the problem you don't really see a lot of knowledge gained and, and you don't see a lot of advancements and, and that's that's why like we start doing this cool stuff with 3d printing like desktop printers are becoming available there's a, the barrier of entries dropped is a platform for people to work and develop and and as long as it's inaccessible you know, it's going to be a very slow climb. Nanotechnology is a concept that deals with scaling down assembly into the molecular level. But, but it's a concept. It's not necessarily the ultimate truth about how to combine materials together. It's one idea. So, no, but so with the yes, level, with the high level possible, of precision. It, it is very possible that nano, nanotechnology will uh, deal with these issues. But for the scale of architecture, perhaps nano, nanotechnology doesn't work. No, because well, why not? Because they're making materials already. I mean, it, you materials, they're not making uh, assemblies, you know, they're making, this is the new material that has these properties combined together, they're not, it's, it's at a nanoscale, these carbon tubes, for example, and so on and so forth. This is a new material Mater for us to use. Materials change But it assemblies. doesn't, it's not the idea of the multi-material we're talking about. But if you can create new materials, why can't you then create new assemblies? Because it's going to change architecture, which always has. Because to... Uh, to have a new material is a good thing, but it, you're choosing it from a catalog. It's, it doesn't matter that's, if it's high That's what tech. architecture does. Oh, but all, that's I mean, ever since like industrialization, this it's, is, you pick stuff out of catalog. This is exactly, I think, that what we're discussing today. Whether, whether we are still, as architects, choosing from a catalog of materials, or whether we include in our design processes ways to combine materials together. Yeah, but there is a precedent for this um, already. There, there is work going on in sort of aerospace where they're working with uh, sort of digital materials. Mm -hmm. So it's the idea that you do do assembly um, of smaller elements, in, you know, not the nanoscale, mm -hmm. but it's in, it becomes a question of resolution. Mm -hmm. and, and that is uh, another way of thinking about sort of multi-materiality. And the benefit of that is that you can, you sort of get away from this chemical bonding of materials. You can actually just have these things assembled. And so th there is that sort of work going on. And I think that's another area which, you know, obviously we haven't discussed yet. Uh, that's what I also wanted to say uh, <laughs> to, to your question. Uh, it's uh, also a question of scale. Mm -hmm. you, you can, with a uh, timber to metal uh, transition, uh, you, you can start uh, building it in a layering process, maybe, uh, and, and bring it together. Uh, and, and then you make different sections and then you have uh, in one section you have 100% timber 
starting up uh, 50-50 to 100% metal. Uh, and you, uh, there, there, are, there are ways to bring these materials together. You have the material transition, you have a stiffness trans transition, everything. Um, <coughs> and you, uh, but this is a other scale to look at it if you want to, on the molecular base, bring uh, metal and uh, timber together. Yeah, I think scale is quite an important question, also since we are architects and want to deal with larger mm -hmm. scales. And of course, we can look into like micro scales to kind of understand principles, but eventually. We don't want to like work with a one by one meter boundary that we can print something in 700 hours. I mean, we also want to have the ability to build larger objects that have these possibilities, and mm -hmm. therefore these concepts can actually apply through like maybe sacrificing to a certain extent um, complexity yeah. and breaking it down. Yeah. Well, I just want to like so like, but I think this is where the idea of like the <coughs> precise control comes from, which we were talking about earlier, and why I was saying like you're saying yeah we can you know it's one concept, but it is probably the best concept and it's the concept that's going to move us towards that future because unless we can precisely say what kind of geometry at that small scale is being created, creating mechanical bonds between materials that might not chemically bind themselves is not going to be a reality. And, and one more thing I want to say. Yeah. Everybody <laughs> gives 3D printing a really hard time to say, oh, 700 hours to make a chair. 700 hours, was it 700 hours? Or whatever. Yeah, to, to make a chair like that, where it, like, I don't, try to find me a person that can do that 700. So it's it's still faster than, than, mm. than that. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> well, <laughs> I think we, if we look at Michael's work, the specific work with the concrete and the and the foaming and the cells, this is where we understand that what is the paradigm. What you're talking about is an assembly at a smaller kind of scale, which is a possible scenario. There's nothing. That go, there's not God did not tell us assembly no, is wrong. That but one. there is the, what he's doing. He's doing. In, Those he's, materials he has, bind. He has a yes. He, what he's doing is like he's spraying concrete on a thing, and he has a way to vary the, the amount of cells. Am I right? The, the amount of foam in it, the amount of the Porosity. bubbles, porosity. But it's it. probabilistic. He didn't choose from a cutter. He didn't say, "I have concrete of type A, concrete of type B, concrete of type C. Let's put them together." He came up with a design that translated into construction that directly mixed the things. So he managed to come up with a workflow that takes material properties, right, but, but bubble okay, and but, cement. But you have to look at the larger. You have to look at the larger economy. What's going to drive these technologies? And that's it's a probabilistic mixture, right? And like yes. that's going to work very well in his application. But mm -hmm. if we want to, if we like, what I'm talking about here, where I'm talking about like materials interfacing with an information economy, mm -hmm. you're going to need very precise modes of depositing these. Uh, this machine is almost precise. In fact, it's, no, it's, 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 it's precise. a problem. No, because it's not. You're not controlling the particles. It's a probabilistic. Def just, it's, you are. You're probabilistically depositing. Uh, okay. If you had multiple printer heads yes. that could that could accurately mm -hmm. deposit those particles and granules, mm -hmm. granules, then you have something that I think is going to fit into the, the infrastructure that we're going to build over the next ten years, mm -hmm. which is going to help us integrate these technologies with with everything else that's happening and already happened to us culturally on the internet and the way we spread information now, it's all going to collapse into one thing. And if you miss that part of the story, you're going to develop the wrong technologies. Yes. Laura. I have a question before we talk later. I hope that will come down a bit. Yeah. <laughs> Um, unless you work the relationship with the industry, which means um, usually when you work with people like Stratasys, you have feedback from how the machine works, and is this change? Does it change the way you design? Is it kind of is basically does it start a collaborative project in terms of what the machine can do and how you can challenge the machine at the same time? Can you repeat that? I'm sorry. Yes, please. Basically, when you work with people as strategists, does it challenge your process of design? Uh, the way, when you understand how you know, the machine can work, what it can do, do you change, also in the modeling process, do you change the way you design, the process how you design? Only if they have a very hands-on creative director. <laughs> and that's in fact, that was the question. I'll just yeah, I mean, it really, it doesn't. I mean, it, you can get, depending on the team, but I don't, I mean, you're working with the technology because you want some attribute of it. So you're saying that somehow the constraints and possibilities of the machine are, are already inbuilt in the kind of work you're doing. That's why you choose that machine to begin with. Yeah, I mean, we don't, I don't just like, 
randomly pick stuff. Yeah. You know, I'm trying to achieve something, so you you find it for a reason. You want that. You want a certain capacity that the machine has. So you work with that basically. You work with the capacity of the machine, and then you take from that point. Yeah, I mean, in in my practice, we're always trying to get to a goal. So it's not that, you know, I don't. I think you might be. I mean, for a researcher, that might be a different situation. But I, I think we're we're, we're direct. We're goal driven, right? So it's. I don't. I rarely find myself in that situation. So in uh, research, it's an iterative process. Uh, so we, we started up coming with design, and then we uh, had the idea of the machine. Uh, brought uh, the mechanical engineer building the machine, and then they told us again what are the boundary conditions, what the machine can do. And we put these boundary conditions, which would be in our, on our side on the material level, on the material properties, back in, in the design process. So, uh, the, for, for this uh, special development, which is uh, just a small piece of multi-materiality, I already <coughs> said, uh, it's just a porosity design with one goal, saving mass, saving CO2. Um, uh, to achieve this goal, we, we had a really iterative process developing the design methods and including the needs uh, of the machine. What, you, no? I thought your process was quite interesting though because uh, somehow the, the transition between the computational model and the real model one in which the real model allowed for all sorts of non-controllable behaviors. The melting, for instance, was one that surely it can only happen through the actual act of physically making it, no? It's mm -hmm. not something I cannot... It could be something that you could go into research later on, but at that stage it was kind of also a slightly uncontrolled state. Yeah, it wasn't and perhaps the beauty of it. No? Yeah, of course. <laughs> but I mean, it was done in only three months, so I touched a lot of kind of aspects which I didn't explore so much in depth that I could say, okay, this is gonna go towards that direction. But it was, I think what was maybe after lo looking at all these um, kind of complex um, and interesting thoughts that you would be presenting today, it was broken very much down to the essentials or like straightforward concepts that would bring this into reality really quick. So the initial brick was kind of rethought and then cast. So this was a technology that exists since centuries, and then the melting or like kind of fusion through heat is also something that's been that's very rudimental, very mm -hmm. literal and ultimate. And in that sense, um, I think of course these kind of uncontrolled moments and moments of imprecision also became part of this project. And maybe it's something that would help in the future people to drive this further quicker. That it doesn't always have to be exact down to the micron and it doesn't have to be completely fully engineered and studied, but it can be something that everybody can try and do mm -hmm. in a certain way. <coughs> Any other questions or thoughts? Um, no? All right, so I think it's, uh, I would like first of all to thank you one more time for all the presentations this morning and the, and the discussion, which was <laughs> very pleasant. <laughs> and. Uh, I think it's 2.30, right? So back at 2.30 for the afternoon session. Thank you. Thank you.